good morning to all the people here and online. My name is Ira Divol. I'm the artistic director of Samus Early Music Festival. And I am very happy to greet you all to our symposium Beyond the Score. This takes place in collaboration with the Brussels Conservatory. It's the second part of a symposium that took place in November this year. And with collaboration of the Cologne University, which we are very thankful for. And here I would like to invite Professor Frank Henschel to give a few words. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, there aren't very much words to be made, really. I'm really happy that you're here. And um, uh, really, from the university, we didn't do anything. Everything did Samus. Uh, I have to say, we just. Uh, uh, give our um, room here and uh, a little bit of the technique and that's really about all. Um, but I'm very glad um, that you're here and um, so um, you're very, very welcome. Um, and yes, um, we are not supposed to make many words, so I'm just uh, uh, introducing the first uh, speaker for uh, today. Um, which is uh, Peter van Hagen, um, and uh, he studied um, recorder uh, first and then uh, was doing uh, more and more research in um, historical performance practices um, from the 16th um, to the 18th century, but is still uh, practicing with the ensembles uh, Morem Maiorum and Met Metzaluna, and he is also uh, a conductor. Um, he conducted the uh, Le Mufati uh, Baroque Orchestra in Brussels and is uh, now conducting the Baroque Orchestra Il Giardellino. And there are a couple of CDs um, that he has uh, produced and he's um, teaching at the um, conservatory in Brussels and uh, Amsterdam. And um, his topic today, where well you can see it uh, over there, it's taught a blessedly enlightened reconstruction of the instrumentation of Alessandro Stigio's 40-part uh, motet Ecce Beatam Lucem, as performed at the Munich court in 1568, according to Massimo Troiano, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Very glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm also very happy, Ira, that what we set up as a sort of collaboration between Brussels and Cologne, although only in, in the terms of the themes and the people, that it worked out. So I'm very glad for that. Without further ado to my presentation, which I'm afraid is going to be a little bit technical, so um, I'm afraid it will be important to concentrated from the beginning. <laughs> Excuse me for this early hour for such a question. In Massimo Troiano's famous account of the lavish wedding festivities at the Ducal Court of Bavaria in Munich in February and March 1568, no less than seven banquets are described in great detail, during which music, mostly motets, was performed with a great variety of voices and instruments. During the last of these banquets on Sunday, March the 7th, a 40-part motet by Alessandro Strigio was performed with eight trombones, eight vials, eight large recorders, a harpsichord, a large lute, and by consequence, 16 singers. Everything under the expert direction of court Kapellmeister Orlando Lassus. Troiano does not provide the title of this motet, but at least since Horst Leuchmann's translation and commentary in 1980, almost everyone agrees that it must have been Ecce Beatam Lucem, for which only one musical source is preserved, and it consists of a complete set of manuscript part books dated 1587 at the Zwickau Rathschulbibliothek. A mere nine pieces in set in more than 30 parts are known to have been composed during the second half of the 16th century. Seven of them are extant, of which two are incomplete, and two are lost. 
And although Thomas Tallis's Spem Inalium is probably the most famous one, it is Alessandro Striggio who is the author of most of these massive compositions. Apart from Ecce Beatam Lucem, an entire 40-part mass from his hand resurfaced in 2005 at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. The Missa Sopra Ecco Si Beato Giorno, of which the last movement, the Agnus Dei, is set in no less than 60 parts. The title of this mass raises the suspicion that the first must have been an earlier madrigal with the name Ecco si beato giorno, on which then the mass was, the mass was later based. Furthermore, the many musical similarities between the mass and the motet, the one I'm talking about here, raise the suspicion that the, this lost madrigal could have been the model for the motet as well. And very probably the motet could even have originated as a mere contrafactum of the madrigal. Bernhard Reiner, in his fantastic book published in 2021, points out that the text of Ecce Beatam Lucem was written by the German neo-Latin poet Paul Schede, also known as Paulus Melissus. Melissus and Lassus knew each other very well, and it is not too far-fetched, therefore, to surmise that Lassus would have commissioned a new text by Melissus, more apt for the occasion, for Strigios Madrigal Ecco si Beato Giorno. But we'll only know for sure if one day the Madrigal resurfaces. According to the Zwickau part books, Ecce Beatam Lucem is set in four choirs of eight, sixteen, six and ten parts, respectively. This, however, only represents the consecutive entries of the respective voices. In reality, there are ten four-part soprano, alto, tenor, bass quartets, which, in analogy with the mass, could be organized into, ten, uh, into five ten-part choirs. Most of these quartets are notated in high clefs or chiavette, but quartets 1b, 3b, and 5b are notated in standard clefs, also called chiave naturali. I will refer to these clefs as high clefs and natural standard clefs, respectively. There is also a part for a basso sequente notated in an F clef on the fourth line. As a whole, the music is thus notated in what is now called mixed clefs. The mode it is set in the Mixolydian mode, with the finales G, Cantus Durus. In his descriptions of musical performances during the banquets, Troiano always reports how many musicians and which instruments were involved, but he never specifies which musician performed which part. This is also the case with Ecce Beatam Luce. The purpose of this presentation is to reconstruct the original instrumentation based on Troiano's description, the compositorial logic of the motet itself, and information gathered from other sources on contemporary performance practice. Among the latter, I do include Pretorius's Syntagma Musicum, of 1619-1620, and this may perhaps raise some eyebrows. However, it is clear that from, uh, from every element in Pretorius's lengthy comments on performance practice, that the period he spans stretches back to the high days of the Bavarian court chapel and the Lassels and the archducal courts at Innsbruck and Graz. A decades-long period of intensive cultural and musical exchange with the most important centers in northern Italy. For Pretorius, the undisputed principal musical genre was still the large-scale polychoral motet and its relatives. On the contrary, more modern Italian genres, most of them already 10 of to 20 years old by then, such as vocal monody, early opera, and instrumental solos, duos, and trios, are left completely untreated in Syntagma Musicum. The bi bibliography on Ecce Beatam Lucem as the most probable candidate for Troiano's motet is extensive. 
A first attempt to reconstruct Troiano's instrumentation was made by Hugh Keat in 1980, the author of the Motet's first edition. Another interpretation was published very recently in the book already mentioned in 2021 by Bernhard Reiner. However, for different reasons which I intend to address shortly, both versions appear to be flawed somehow. And although Bernhard Reiner took notice and even in passing referred to my own interpretation published in 2005, he did not comment on it in detail. As far as CD recordings are concerned, I found seven versions released between 1995 and 2019. Unfortunately, we do not have time to, and also the 40 voices, I mean, it doesn't make sense, but indeed. In almost none of them, an attempt is even made to incorporate Troiano's instrumentation. Three of them are purely vocal, three use a personal mix of voices and instruments, and only one, the most recent one, recorded by Roland Wilson, comes close to what Triano describes. Yet even there, a number of elements are missing, as I will explain. Of course, in the broader perspective of Renaissance performance practice, there are many ways to perform this motet, and the 1568 Munich version is definitely not the only one possible. In fact, at least as far as Renaissance pitch standards and transposition practices are concerned, all of these recorded versions are possible and acceptable. But the purpose of this paper is to reconcile the music with all of the elements in Troiano's description. And I am still convinced that my own interpretation is the only one that successfully does that. Let us start by looking at the various theoretical options. First of all, what seems most obvious for the modern, not so well-informed performer is actually also a historical accurate option. And that is a performance at notated pitch at any of the then current pitch standards. And here I go wrong. Pitch standards are low, yeah. Which, by the way, also included modern standard pitch. Now, as you can see, most of the recorded versions are performed in this way. According to a wealth of historical sources, Music notated in natural standard clefs, to the left, was performed at notated pitch, or come sta, while music notated in high clefs, to the right, was transposed down a fourth or a fifth, depending on the signature, that is, the presence of a flat or the absence of a flat. According to Pretorius, however, pieces notated in mixed clefs, as is, in the, case, as is the case with Ecce Beata Nucem, should be performed at pitch or transposed down a tone in order to accommodate the soprano singers. That's what he writes. Those pieces, however, that cover an overall, overall range of three octaves in which the soprano is set in a high clef and the bass in a low one, as from low F to high A or from low G to high G, these pieces cannot be transposed a fourth or a fifth down. They should, on the contrary, remain as the composer has set them, or perhaps, in order to accommodate the soprano singer, be transposed to the nearest key, a tone down. A performance at, at notated pitch with Troiano's instrumentation is only conceivable if one considers what I would call horizontal instrumentation. That is, assigning the lower instruments to the lowest parts, and the higher instruments together with the voices to the higher parts. However, Troiano's number of 24 monophonic instruments and 16 singers does not accord very well with Strigio's numbers of high, middle, and low voices, as you can see. And that is exactly what Hugh Keat struggled with in the introduction to his 1980 edition and what prevented him from finding a satisfactory solution for the instrumentation. Vertical instrumentation seems more logical then, that is, with whole concerts of singers, recorders, viols, and trombones, each time four voices in every register. So a voice in an instrument or a voice in every register. Let us first have a look how such instrumental concerts look like. Extant instruments in museum collections attest to the fact that Renaissance recorders 
existed in many different pitches. 16th century treatises, however, here on the top right, mention only four nominal sizes, a bassette in F, a tenor alto in C, and a descant in G. These mean always the lowest note, all holes closed, F, C, G. And a soprano in D, sorry, I forgot this one. To which Pretorius, top left, added a great bass in low F and a bass in B flat. Now the names for these sizes that I use here are mainly based on Pretorius. Just as transverse flutes, recorders sounded an octave above notated pitch. Each extant instrument cases, however, attest to the fact that Renaissance recorder concerts were almost always comprised of sizes tuned in adjacent, adjacent fifths. Since middle parts were always performed on instruments of the same size, only a maximum of three different sizes were ever needed for the performance of music with a standard overall range. And for those exceptional pieces notated in mixed clefs, that is, pieces with an exceptionally large overall range, a fourth size could be added. In other words, the strict fifth relation between the sizes made any mentioning in treatises of more than four nominal sizes simply redundant. Recorder players would indeed play in different, many different registers, always using adjacent sizes tuned fifth apart. But as, far, uh, but as for the association of fingerings with musical notation, the lowest size could always be considered a virtual bass in F, the middle size a virtual tenor alto in C, the regular top size a virtual desk and in G, and the exceptional additional higher size a virtual soprano in D. And this completely independent of the actual sounding pitches of the instruments that were used. Some 16th century inventories of instruments confirm the existence of recorder concerts comprised um, of six sizes tuned in consecutive fifths. That's the, the second line here on the slide. Such a set tuned either to 440 or 466, for example, would have consisted of a great bass in F, basses in C, bassettes in G, you can read it out, tenor altos in D, descans in A, and sopraninos in A. Any larger size of instrument than a great bass in F is simply inconceivable, since it would be beyond any player's finger stretch. Other sets were comprised of, yet other sets were comprised of sizes tuned to different sounding pitches, always depending on the sounding pitch of the largest size. For example, with the bass in E flat and then consecutive fifths. Of course, this all works very well as long as recorder players are performing without the accompaniment of voices or other instruments, since sounding pitch is not an issue in that case. However, as soon as recorders were combined with other instruments, a common pitch standard need, um, needed to be established. And this is the case with the instruments described by Pretorius. For Pretorius, it is the recorder concert register of basset, tenor, and alto. So, Oh, excuse me. Being a little bit too enthusiastic here. So, beset this one, huh? beset tenor and alto. Actually, I have a pointer. Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> um, that is tuned to his reference pitch of A plus 1, 466. And that is the reason why the adjacent fifth rule cannot apply in relation to his largest size, since a great bass recorded in E flat would simply to be too large to handle. So it is tuned in F, a fourth instead of a fifth below the next smaller size. Instruments tuned to the sounding pitches listed by Pretorius are extant. All of these are made by members of the family Bassano, who were active in London and Venice from before the middle of the 16th century through the first decades of the 17th century. They made instruments for clients throughout Europe. However, it is true, as Bernhard Reiner pointed out, uh, out, that many more bass recorders in C and besets in G are extant, as you see here on the second line, including instruments that were made during the second half of the 16th century by makers such as the Venetian Gerolamo Zalbrun, obviously a German, 
Although basses in C, bassets in Gs, and tenor altos in D are not nominal pitches, it cannot have escaped the attention of contemporary players that these sizes sound exactly an octave lower than the three highest nominal sizes. And therefore, perfectly suited for a performance at a notated pitch of a piece that would else have sounded as usual, and that is an octave above notation, notated pitch. But when Troiano mentioned flauti grossi, he definitely meant the lowest register with the three largest sizes. Because elsewhere in his account, at the fifth course of the wedding banquet on February the 22nd, he mentions just flauti, which then clearly point at regular recorder sizes. Pretorius has something interesting to say about the use of such a low recorder concert register. When one should wish to use the recorders alone without other instruments in a canzona or secular vocal piece, motet, or also in a polychoral piece, one could use the whole recorder Stimmwerk very appropriately, especially the five bottom sizes, since the small ones sound and scream too loud. And this produces a very lovely, soft and nice sound, <coughs> especially in rooms and chambers, since in churches the large bassett and bass recorders cannot be heard well. Therefore, too, <coughs> should the other choirs that play with them, that is, with the large bassett and bass recorders, orchestrated, for example, with viols and voices, perform their music with subdued voice, softly and sweetly, so that each choir and voice can be heard distinct from the others. Now, assuming that trombones are also capable of playing softly and swiftly and sweetly, this seems to match the 5068 performance circumstances of Ecce Beatam Lucem perfectly. The only remaining question in relation to the flauti grossi is whether the most appropriate instruments would be FCG or F, B flat F sizes. I will come back to that. In contrast to the flauti grossi and the liuto grosso, Troiano does not qualify it di violi da gamba or da arco, as he did for the fifth course of the wedding banquet on February the 22nd, where he mentions viole di gamba grosse. Large instruments with the bottom string tuned to low D or E existed indeed during the second half of the 16th century and were apparently even used for the festivities of 5068. But for Ecce Beatam Lucem, it seems that mainly the regular sizes, bass, tenor, and descant were involved. These sizes had their bottom strings tuned to G, D, and A, respectively, although there are alternative tunings, as you can see, um, the basses can be in A and the descans also tuned in G. In viol concerts too, the same size of instrument was used for both the tenor and the alto part. I believe though, that in spite of Troiano's omission of the adjective grosso, at least one such great bass viol must have been involved, as we will see later. And the presence of just one grosso instrument in a group of otherwise regular sizes might explain why Troiano did not choose to refer to the group as a whole with the term viole grosse. Trombones were not only very often used in consorts together with cornets, but regularly also in self-contained consorts comprised of two or three different sizes, depending on the desired register. The tenor trombone in A, with a range from low E to high A, the bass trombone in D, with a range from low, e to low A to high D, and the crooked down bass trombone in C, crooked down to A, with a range from low E to high A. Alto trombones, as described by Pretorius, did not exist yet in 5068. Since Troiano is always very accurate in describing the exact nature of the instruments involved, we should not assume that he used the term tromboni here as a pars pro toto for a concert of cornets and trombones. Nor should we assume that any larger size was involved, involved for Ecce Beatam Lucem than the bass trombone in D, since he would definitely have used a similar formula as for the second course of the wedding banquet on February the 22nd, where he mentioned large trombones which descend an octave lower than the other regular ones. 
Now, armed with all this knowledge and insights, let us now try to think of a vertical instrumentation according to Troiano's descriptions for a performance at notated pitch of Ecce Lucem, uh, Beatam Lucem. For the, vo for the viols, high cleft music is simply out of reach, but they could perform two of the three standard cleft quartets. Here they are highlighted in purple. I hope the purple comes through, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the recorders, highlighted in green, could perform two of the seven high cleft quartets on either of the sizes that I mentioned before. However, apart from the question whether these sizes can still be called flauti grossi, this would never actually work, because as far as balance is concerned, these middle-sized instruments would have to compete with most or all of the singers singing at the very top of their registers. But there is a much more compelling reason to seize our efforts right away, right here, since there is absolutely nothing left that fits the range of the two trombone quartets. Without an alto trombone, even the sole remaining standard cleft quartet is simply out of reach for a concert of trombones. Conclusion, a transposition of at least a fourth or a fifth seems imperative. But is it then okay to transpose down a piece notated in mixed clefts more than a tone? Well, if purely vocal, definitely not. Pretorius is very clear on this, as I mentioned before. But with viols and trombones, things are different. Although throughout Syntagma Musicum, Pretorius unvaryingly links the consort of viols with music notated in standard natural clefts, he actually seems to prefer a lower sound register for these instruments. More and more, however, music for the viol concert is now cleft about in the same way as the first trombone concert that follows hereafter. For this reason, that the smallest string on the desk and viol is really thin and cannot be heard as loudly as the other thicker strings on the alto tenor or bass viols. It is better, therefore, that one uses an alto tenor viol instead of the discant, or stays as much as possible on the thicker strings of the discant. The clefts that follow, then, for this trombone concert he refers to are standard natural clefts, but with an alto clef for the soprano and a tenor clef for the altos. I will so show the clefts in a minute. To choose music with lower upper parts was apparently one possibility for obtaining a lower register for the viol consort, but Pretorius proposes yet another one. Englishmen, when they perform on viols alone, transpose sometimes everything a fourth or a fifth lower in such a way that they consider the bottom string of the small bass to be tuned in D, of the tenor and alto in A, and of the descant in E. Whereas normally, as can be seen in the table above, which I don't give here, all these instruments, counting from Camerton, are tuned a fifth lower, that is, a bass in G, a tenor in D, and a descant in A. And this procedure gives the instrumental concert a much more agreeable, magnificent, and delectable harmony than if one would play at pitch. We do not know, of course, how common this English practice was already in southern Germany around 1568. At any rate, Pretorius proposes still another possibility. It is better and very comfortable, therefore, to transpose down a fourth or a fifth all motets, concerts, sonatas, and canzonas that are notated in such and similar clefs, and he means natural standard clefs, as indicated under the clefs in this example above. And this can be done in the same way on large sub-bass vials, where the bass vial is used as a descant. For the concert of trombones, things are even more clear as, for, as far as Pretorius is concerned. On the table of clef systems at the beginning of his chapter on the trombone and bassoon choir, the clef system mentioned earlier is only the first and the highest of the ones that he finds appropriate. All other systems have even lower clefs, and on the subsequent five pages, Pretorius explains in great detail how, how music in standard natural clefs should be transposed down a fourth or a fifth for concerts of low instruments such as trombones, bassoons, or bombards. 
So it seems clear that a downward transposition of a fourth or fifth is what is needed here. The recorders and the singers could thus comfortably perform six of the seven high cleft quartets, while the trombones could comfortably perform two of the three natural standard cleft quartets. One four-part concert of viols, viols with regular sizes could perform the remaining high cleft quartet, and the other four-part concert comprised of lower sizes could perform the remaining natural standard cleft quartet. It becomes more clear when I show you this schedule a bit later. <laughs> I hope. A problem is perhaps the fact that there are only four quartets of singers while the music is organized in five choirs, as I mentioned before. But do we actually need singers in all five choirs in order to ensure that the whole text is recited? Let us have a look. On this two-page table, I listed all the consecutive entries, text entries, musical entries, in Ecce Beatam Lucem, indicating in two shades of gray the places where one choir sings alone or quasi alone, that is, joined with, by just one or two voices from another choir. Two things can be observed. A, that there is a fair of amount of dialogue between choirs one and five. And B, that choir two is the only choir that never performs alone. So no singers are actually needed there. Bernhard Reiner has probably overlooked this element. With singers here highlighted in blue, allocated to choirs two through five, his choir one is entirely instrumental. And this creates three moments without any text at all, which I highlighted in red here. To be fair, all these moments are fragments that occur twice or thrice. But I wonder whether it makes sense to first play an entry and then sing it, as in two of these moments, including the very beginning. So the motet would just begin with a few notes of instruments and then the text would sit in. One rather expects the contrary, I should think as in here in the third moment. Reiner also creates three moments with just one or two singers singing, highlighted here in purple, which seems a bit thin all of a sudden in the context of such massive performance forces. Now, there are more elements that I find questionable in Reiner's instrumentation, uh, such as his argumentation for a downward transposition of a fourth rather than a fifth, and his argumentation for C and G beset recorders rather than B flat and F sizes. I will come back to that at the end of my presentation, which is very nearby. The version that incorporates most of Troiano's indications and that come closest to my own instrumentation, published in 2005 and presented here with just one minor modification, is without any doubt the version by Roland Wilson, recorded in 2019. Wilson and I agree on many points. First, on assigning a quartet of singers, here in blue, to choirs one, three, four, and five. Two, on avoiding a combination of trombones in yellow and recorders, here in green, within the same choir, for obvious dynamic reasons. Three, on assigning the quartets with the highest bass parts in choir two and four to the recorders rather than to the vials and the voices, so that the lowest sound is not the, the carrying sound of the choir. I mean, so that a bass recorder is not the lowest sound. Huh? That's what I mean. Four, on an equal instrumentation for choirs one and five in order to underscore the frequent dialogues between those choirs, and related to that, on assigning vials to choir three, since the part writing of choir three is generally much more agile than in choirs one and five. It is rhythmically more complex and contains more eight notes, fuse, chrome. Thus, I think it is better suited for vials than for trombones. By the way, the vocal bass of quartet 3A is also the only one with a lower range. It descends two notes lower than the other Chiavetti high cleft quartets. My reconstruction of Troiano's instrumentation differs from Wilson's in two respects. First, for some reason, he opted for high recorder consorts instead of the flauti grossi described by Troiano. And secondly, even if he would have used low recorders, 
he would have run into balance problems due to the fact that he chose to transpose down a fourth rather than a fifth, which I think could well have been the very reason why he ended up using high recorders in the first place. I believe that a downward transposition of a fifth would enable the singers to sing more softly and sweetly, thus creating a better balance with the recorders. The recorder players, in their turn, had then better use B-flat basses and f sets rather than C and G sizes in order to avoid the number of fork fingerings and increase the number of louder open fingerings and also for being able to play the solo low B-flat in part 27. Part 27 in the recorder part transposed has a low B-flat. Furthermore, a transposition of a fifth down would have avoided the high B-naturals in parts 5 and 37 notes that were considered out of reach for a tender trombone in A. Nevertheless, I believe that balance within the ensemble would be a serious issue during rehearsals anyway. But if it worked in 5068 for Lassos, isn't it our task to make it work today? Isn't it our goal to find out how the music really sounded and how musicians really sang and played and isn't this precisely what historically or culturally informed performance practice is all about? Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we still got time uh, for a discussion. So, yeah, any commentaries or questions, you're invited to speak up. Maybe you can go, if there is there a question from either or a comment to you, Peter, from Yeah, there is, is there a question or a comment to you from Ron Wilson in I the chat. I expected that, I expected that. <laughs> And he's uh, writing here, Flauti Grossi does not necessarily mean eight foot pitch. Anything bigger than the G discant was referred to as Flauto Grosso or Flauton. Yeah, well, I don't, do not agree with that, but that's a discussion we can have. I mean, it depends, of course. There are indeed, in the beginning of the 16th century, sources that uh, mention um, Grosso in relation to a larger instrument, but as larger instruments got more and more um, in use, uh, they refer to the lowest register. And um, I cannot prove that, but the, it is very probable because it is the same principle that is applied to other concerts, as I mentioned, to vials and to trombones. So um, there is nothing grosso about the, 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 the normal four um, part quartet. But this is, a, this is a matter of interpretation and of discussion. Uh, I will maybe just read his Absolutely. reply to that. To, um, uh, sorry, Peter, but there is no way eight-foot recorder concert would balance with the trombones. Yes. And he has the advantage of having it tried out. So that is an argument that I find an argument. I mean, let's try it. Yes. Um, I hope he has tried it then for his production, which I absolutely love. Huh? Um, I have not tried it out, so practice will teach us. Uh, uh, but I still think that transposing a fourth down um, forces his singers in the high register to be still um, quite loud, which is fine, eh? which, is, which is fine and which is appropriate for other music. And I think that transposing a fifth down could have solved already the balance problems. But again, I must yield in this, in this respect. He has, I hope he has tried out. The, um, the effect with the large recorders, I haven't. Then I, I have my own question, which is rather not uh, musicological, maybe, but uh, do you have any concrete plans or non concrete plans to try it out? <laughs> no, for the very simple reason that it will be very difficult to get the right size of instruments together, even the eight recorders, for example. Um, and it's paying 40 people for five minutes of music, so. All these instruments exist? Actually, hmm? all these instruments, do they exist? Yes, all of them. I, I know people who own all of these instruments, um, absolutely. Um, but I will I call Roland because he might have tried out, and so I'm very curious for his experiences. And still, it's not because it seems not to work nowadays that we should not try hard, right? Huh? 
the question? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to ask you if there are any other examples extant that can support uh, what you're proposing or that you've looked at. I'm sure you've looked at many uh, manuscripts of pieces like this uh, that would support uh, what you're what you're proposing here? In terms of the well, I mean, of it. no, because there are no um, Renaissance motets will will only be described in the orchestration of Renaissance motets and Renaissance madrigals will only be described in in literary sources. So there are lots of them in Pretorius, for example, which, by the way, also he uses what he calls large recorders and then specifies the sizes. Huh? Um, um, so the, the, the use of these large sizes is, is absolutely documented. Pretorius also, but this is Pretorius, huh? but as I told you, it might, um, it might be res um, representative for what happened at uh, Lasso's chapel. Um, for example, when, when he doubles a complete motet at, at 16 foot pitch, so singers singing at eight foot pitch and then vials doubling that, literally an octave lower, as something that is, has never been tried out um, as far as I know or in current, it's definitely not in current practice, but there are lots of indications of that sort of practices. And, and this is also still an, an answer a bit to Roland. Um, I really think that um, we focus much too much on um, in performances on, on greatness and loudness. I mean, we think we imagine these polychoral uh, symphony and, uh, by, and, and madrigals and motets by Giovanni Gabrielli, and we think, oh, magnificent. But people um, in those days were also very interested in intimacy and in, in absolutely um, chamber atmospheres where, where, where players were even appreciated, not for their virtuosity, but for how soft they could play. Huh? Um, so um, that's why you have lutes, that's why you have file concerts, that's why have, the large recorders were so popular, that's why you have clavichords even up till the 18th century in court music, because it is that intimacy that they were looking for. So I really do believe, but again, Roland has a point, try it out first, huh? um, um, that even these very large um, scale works could have been performed in absolutely um, soft, um, in a soft way. But this is only part an answer to your, to your question. Eh? So the indications that we have are literary. There is no other kind of, how could there be? Except for the existence of many of these instruments, of course. Eh? There are lots of extant instruments, all these large instruments, so they must have been used for something. Just one other question relating to that. Do they, we know the size of the room this was performed in? Is it uh, I don't. Uh, I don't personally, but I'm sure that Bernhard Reiner, and this is an interesting question. Thank you for that. I did not include that in my lecture today, but I'm sure that Bernhard Reiner's book of 2021, 20, uh, that is on music at the Bavarian court, highly recommended the book, um, that he will know exactly in which room it, it um, took place. But I can't give you that answer now. That just relates to exactly what you said in terms of the playing quietly and, uh, yeah. of course, today's concert halls yeah. don't uh, yeah. lend themselves at all to what we're talking about here. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. We do? Oh, am I just here? Um... One could argue that Lasso, in using the eight-foot recorders, was trying to thin out the texture and did not want them to be heard as loudly as the rest. Yeah. I think that he might have a point there. Absolutely, think. And this is also the logic of the, of the division of the choirs eh, that Roland made, and that is exactly the, one, the ones I would make. Um, so I think he has a point there, that it's... Uh, Perhaps we, sh we should not look for too much of a balance between the trombones and the, and the recorders there, but that there is something soft going on and that the text, uh, yeah, I think he has a good point. I could agree to that. Are there more questions? Well, if that's not the case, we can just go on. Um, and uh, I should uh, introduce Sigrid Toft, I don't know how to pronounce it, I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, she studied uh, musicology and uh, uh, was then uh, uh, working at a broadcasting uh, station 
um, for uh, classic, uh, classical radio. And she also founded uh, dance uh, ensembles uh, like Passo Ostinato, uh, Fontainebleau, and Corpo Barocco. And um, uh, still another aspect is she did um, uh, um, Oh, the English really. She did, uh, she's director of uh, operas, um, and um, that start, started in 2009 with uh, Handel's Rada Misto at the uh, Handel uh, Festspiele, uh, and she did a lot of uh, more directing um, uh, afterwards. And uh, her repertoire also includes um, a lot of um, pieces um, that she uh, had found herself, so brought to light um, anew. And we are not exactly um, uh, um, following the, the program um, where it, it says it's in a, a paper about uh, in the wake of the Euridice experiment staging Italian opera in the early 17th century, uh, but rather there will be probably about this topic, I guess, uh, a talk uh, between Peter and her. And um, well, we will see what it's about. Thank you very much. Hello, Sigrid. Hello, Peter. <laughs> it's a bit strange to be here in such a formal way with the two of us because we are old partners in crime eh? yes, uh, for, a long time. for many, many, many years. Um, you were also the, um, the chair in the, um, the first part of this um, bi bipartite <laughs> uh, symposium. So you were the, the chair in the, the Brussels uh, um, leg of this symposium on, on December 5th. Um, and um, one of the lectures there was, was completely in your field of expertise, I would say, and that was the uh, lecture by Francesca Fantapie and Tim Carter, uh, who had just published an, um, a new book with the title Staging, Staging Euridice, Theatre, Sets and Music in Late Renaissance Florence. Um, now, which gave us the idea, okay, well, this is definitely all um, information beyond the score, huh? um, but could you tell me, you, as a, as a stage director in the first place, how did you, wh what was the impact, or wh how would you judge the importance of um, the book and the presentation by, by Francesca and Tim? Um, how important is that for, for this field of expertise, for this field of knowledge, domain of study? It is very important um, because the moment you start staging a piece from the 17th or early or 18th century, um, when you are in a normal environment of a theatre, there tend to be a dramaturge uh, who is helping you uh, to do the whole research. Um, and in my field, I've always been my own dramaturg <laughs> because most of them are not uh, really into the field of, of what we are searching for on one hand. And on the other hand, also for me, when I'm searching myself, um, it is hard to find information. And especially in the musical field, the moment you have musicology um, research, the whole contextualization of theatrical music is absent. Um, so the research you have to do for staging uh, a piece known or even, uh, well, especially unknown, I mean, just come to light, um, is a painstaking uh, diving into archival uh, information sometimes. And um, you don't have always so much time uh, to do that and uh, even money to do, all, to do all that. Or, well, in the last years even, the time is very, very, very short. So... Um, uh, for example, when I was doing uh, Mozart opera, I was so glad to read John Rice's books on staging uh, um, uh, whatever Mozart opera, because the piles of literature on Mozart is like this for theatrical music, but the information on really staging and what was the whole context in that sense is so difficult to find. Uh, and if you find them, then uh, when they are written by non-musicologists, the whole aspect of music is then torn out and you don't have this 
combination, the connection between the two. So that was... Correlation uh, even. Yeah, yes, yeah, of yeah. course. Um, and then that was for, for me, the book from um, Tim Clarkner and uh, Francesca Van Tapier was, was just marvelous. But I mean, um, what, it's also the very first opera uh, uh, that they described. Uh, so in that sense, it's a, it's a very important event. But how does that, could you explain us simple musicians and, and uh, musicologists, uh, how important that, that could be could possibly be to know in what circumstances, in what hall, in on what stage, with what dimensions, um, such an such an opera. Well, opera. I can't use the word opera yet. Eh, for for the religion, but such a play, music play, was was performed. In general, what is the importance of that? Well, the whole the whole composition, be it 17th or 18th century uh, music, the, the way they compose, um, the um, the way certain uh, recitare or recitativi, uh, later ariosi and uh, arias afterwards, the whole way it is constructed, was constructed with the stage in mind, uh, to start with that already. Um, and, um, uh, the whole dynamics of um, uh, action is so much um, related to where you are on stage and if what it means action <laughs> if this is only a bodily action or a dramaturgical uh, action of you know going from left to right and front to back um, I think that's it's in incredibly important to see that this this is composed first of all from a dramaturgical play text, <laughs> um, so that the text in that sense is not only the text is first, but the, the dramaturgical, theatrical text is there. Mm -hmm. um, and to see that the music and the composing is done to put the visual display uh, towards an audience and towards eyes and not only towards uh, ears. But uh, of course I know you and I know for a long time that for you that correlation to what there is that what, what there is to be heard and what there is to be seen, that this forms a unity, and you know my opinion on that as well. But um, how sacrosanct is this relation, actually? I mean, why would... I mean, we, we see lots of, of, of operas today, Baroque operas that are performed with modern stagings. Um, why do you find it so important that, that, that this correlation um, between what there is to see and... and, and um, because they are, it's all. It's, it's so artificial for me to ask you this question, <laughs> but it's still. <laughs> it is. It is written with the same aesthetics um, in mind. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you can um, perform a 17th or 18th century opera in a modern way, and there are people um, who can really enjoy that, and there is nothing wrong with that. Only there are two different ways. Sometimes you really have to close your eyes to be able to listen to the music because they are telling a total different story. The um, images are telling a different story. Oh, of course, the images are totally telling a, a different story. And um, if all the aspects, the visual ones and the audible ones, then you hear what you see and you see what you hear. And it, it's, it's the same language. Um, and I think that when um, the visual display all the visuals, decor, costume, lighting, um, uh, gesturing, um, acting, walking, uh, dancing, uh, if this is all um, created in the same uh, aesthetical um, direction, then the music that is composed in that way, which is basically a rhetorical one, um, and um, that all the visual displays do not tell a story in itself, which can be very interesting and a very um, um, challenging, maybe, uh, very phys uh, psychological, um, searching for all sorts of double dimensions and irony and comments and um, contemporization to now, question mark. Um, I think when, when this is not the case, then he, the music speaks much more like it is and not like somebody wants it to speak. And, and of course this is from the perspective of the audience, eh? uh, mm -hmm. but um, from the perspective of the, the many, many, many singers with whom you work together already staging, um, 
mainly 18th century operas, mm -hmm. we'll come to, to that in a minute. Um, to, are, are they also convinced of that principle? Do they also confirm that, that um, what you just said, that there is an, all of a sudden there is an evidence in, in what they... Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I think the whole the whole um, attitude of mm, we cannot do that anymore because we don't understand it anymore and it's not modern and so on. The moment you start working with singers, um, it might be a little bit difficult in the beginning because they are not used to use their body in that way. Um, but after maybe an hour, <laughs> Uh, they feel themselves and their colleagues hear it, how much um, the whole way of singing changes mm -hmm. um, and how, how all the images they use, they need to, make it, to know what gesture they have to make. So they have to have a very clear idea of what affect it is and that there is a lot more between love and hate, but that the color red is this color red and not another one. That makes it so clear what the concept of what they sing, what the effect is, what they sing, that they sing totally different. Mm -hmm. They are incredibly, uh, singers are incredibly um, grateful to at last um, have um, a vocabulary for their body that they eventually even could use in non-theatrical uh, music or in other concert uh, situations. Um, very often also I have comments of people in the orchestra during or after production, even from musicians who are sitting in the pit somewhere uh, not being able to see a lot uh, of what is going on, that the whole atmosphere and the working together and feeling that all the noses of all the aspects of the opera is going into the same direction, um, that there is um, a feeling of being piece of a theater, a theatrical uh, performance, and not only they're sitting in the pit and having, you know, just the end uh, musical probe and then just do the job and look to the, um, to the musical director, but that it is much more connected with the stage. Um, it, is, it is sometimes very difficult to pinpoint, um, but the... Um, the rewarding, the most, for me personally, the most rewarding um, affects, um, 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 results of doing staging in that direction is especially, and just this reaction of singers and musicians, that they feel they can breathe out and they breathe together. Um, and they do not have to fight so, um, against another world that is, that is presented on, on stage. And, and we, we can, I mean, we are not a little bit, now a little bit um, away from our initial theme. We'll come back to mm -hmm. that in a minute. But um, can we honestly say that there is enough um, information on how this mm. bodily language worked um, to cover the period that we are covering with, uh, with our music programs? I mean, and perhaps not the 17th century, we come back to that, but for example, 18th century, 19th yes. century. There is even, even 17th century, even late uh, 16th century. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Of course, the later you go, the more information you have that is very specifically for theatrical display. And there is also much more um, iconographical information mm -hmm. um, in all sorts of treatises, um, which is a little bit less for the, for the 17th century. But it is huge what is there. Mm -hmm. Um, it's one of the things that have to be researched uh, better. <laughs> um, um, there is not so much contemporary um, research, research published about it. So the difficulty is that you, everybody who does that has to go to the sources. Um, so that is already a level um, that not everybody obtains. Um, and um, well, a lot of information, for example, is used from the beginning of the 19th century because there was um, um, there is one book, uh, Gilbert Austin. It's the only one who had um, tried um, to make a notation system for bodily work. Um, and, but this is, this is the beginning of the 19th century, although it's a language that um, we can still see into uh, black and white films of the uh, early 20th century. It is still used, this whole um, display of uh, using the body to uh, accompany um, what is said, what is sung. Um, it, is, um, hmm, it is not always uh, easy to just uh, use 
a system from the beginning of the 19th century and to transpose it to a Chesty or a Cavalli, for example. And we need much more uh, research in that sense. Um, also, the information that we have there is um, in comparison to music, when we have information about music, it's really only about music. But the acting uh, and the whole way of being on stage, um, we have to correlate much more with um, um, treatises on um, court conduct, uh, treatises on dance, treatises um, on um, painting. Um, so we have on uh, public speech uh, in court, in church, uh, in declamation. So the information uh, about staging is much vaster, yeah. where we have to also sometimes re read between the lines. You have to look for prompt books, for example, for um, descriptions of people who travel throughout Europe and visit opera houses and describe the conduct of, of singers or what is happening on stage. So we, we have to distract much more information, but it is there, so abundant. The, and, and I have also the impression that it has always been there. Huh? It is a continuous um, um, presence. Huh? There's, there's no interruption from antique times, well, as far as we can judge, at least since the Renaissance to... Well, it is based, it is based a, a part of the whole gesture, which is, of course, much more than an ada cadabra with, with the hands. I yeah, mean, yeah. It's, a, it's a whole body, it's eyes, it's walking, it's a blocking, uh, what we call now blocking, st um, the way you stand, where you stand in stage, on the stage, when you go off, when you go out and if you are in a group, the half circle and all, all these things. But the whole body uh, language, especially for the hands, is based on quintillion. And so it, would, it should be one of the first things that everybody reads. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and it, and it, is, it is there already. Um, yeah, from, the from the 16th century, we can already read translations even, so that should make it uh, more easy. But it is very seldom done. So what I, what I gather from all that is that actually staging an opera with what we could do then in, in a visually historically informed way huh? um, entails many, many, many different, m many different things. So it's perhaps not surprising that we do not have a clear method for, for every single period. Now I know um, you, especially with, with, with late 17th and, and uh, 18th century, uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen your late 18th century theatre that you spoken theatre that you stage as well. Um, but actually, there is. What is your experience with early 17th century? To come back to the period of Peri, the book by Francesca Fantapie and Tim Carter. Well, my experience are um, are most most of it pedagogical. Mm -hmm. um, so I never staged a Cavalli, a Monteverdi. Well, I choreographed Monteverdi, but I did not do the staging. Mm -hmm. Um, I did a lot of um, pieces of early opera, Italian pre-1650 opera, so to speak, in school productions. And of course, all the rest is Lully and Purcell and mm -hmm. things like that. But really very, very early um, uh, performances I have not um, mm -hmm. done. Um, so I would like to do much more just to, to try out a lot of things that are so in you the sources. Francesca Caccina's libera Liberazione? Yes, uh, Francesca Caccina's Liberazione, um, I did. Yeah. Um, uh, I did the, um, uh, the prologue and the epilogue. Oh, okay. Um, and that was um, one of my first things that I did. Um, and uh, the mid piece was done by a modern director. Mm -hmm. So that was a very good experience, which learned me never to do that again. Um, <laughs> but I, I learned a lot from it, uh, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and so um, it is very important to do much more of this, of this work because um, one of the things that is uh, difficult to um, establish is to see, the, although it is a language that is very, very constant through more than two, 200, almost 300 years, where the evolutions are. Um, because I have the tendency to feel that in early, in everything that I read in sources, that um, there was much more continuous gesticulating, although it had to be done with sprezzatura and it had to, to accompany the text, etc., et etc. Et but there was a like a constant movement of the body and 
of the arm, of the gesture, of the azione, of the gestical azione. There are so many words, and already this is something that has to be studied very well. The description of movement in every language. What that the words what, mean. What the yeah. words really mean. But that, for example, there is a much more continuous flowing of the gesture until the phrase is empty, for example. Uh, and then suddenly, uh, in other sources, like 100 years later, you see first act, then sing, or then speak. So there is a big difference. Um, and it is... Um, it makes sense because there is also much more recital cantando yes. in these early yes. operas. Of so and, and in that sense, it goes together again yeah. with, with the music. Um, but I would like to, to, um, to do much more uh, 17th century uh, staging just in order to uh, test what is in the sources um, and, and see how it, uh, and again, how it works. And again, you will have to... Uh, sort of put put many different sources together again yes. to to f to form an idea of what it could have been. It's not like for 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 us musicians sometimes things are a bit more simple. I mean, of course we we also engage in the culture, or we also study at least if we have time for it. And, and for the whole cultural context is important to understand mm -hmm. the music. But still, there are more direct uh, mm -hmm. indications. Well, that. That is how it is done. With For with example, um, uh, rappresentazione di arma del corpo in the, f in the yeah. introduction, Cavalieri really gives a lot of staging information, of blocking information on when mm -hmm. to even to step forward when you sing, when you are in a chorus and, and somebody comes out. So it, the whole uh, mechanics are described. Daphne, uh, Gagliano in Daf Daphne, the same thing. So it would be interesting to use that information and really see make a reconstruction yeah. Yeah. just to understand the language more and then uh, we have more tools by which we that we can use in in other productions from the yeah. same time yeah because the, um, and, um, uh, of course Fran uh, Francesca and Tim's book is, is magnificent and it's also about the first ever opera and to just to imagine that in the Palazzo Pitti and now know in which room it was played and how the stage looked like is, is absolutely fantastic but there are so many more elements in staging an opera than and the aesthetic of the room and, and the, the location and the sizes. Um, there was, and of course, there was very little in Francesca's yes, there was, there on was body a, language. Actually. There was an, an, um, a chapter on that body language, and of course they mentioned Corrago, and um, I think they also m uh, mentioned um, the Perucci, which is a little bit later uh, published, about um, 1700. Uh, also Bonifacio, um, L'Arte dei Cenni, so the, the art of the signs, which is like a catalog of body movements. Um, but they take then, uh, because it, it's just a little small <laughs> chapter, yeah. um, I found that um, I was a, a little bit hungry about much more, and then the taking uh, certain phrases of these, um, um, well, Coragua is a manuscript, or of prints uh, concerning with, um, with body movements, when you take them out of their context, and then conclude, um, oh yes, there was no action anymore. Uh, no action anymore, what do you mean with action? Or um, a certain phrase where um, uh, Corago, for example, uh, mentions that when you, um, that there is a, a difference between action in speech, so without music, or an action in singing, and then saying, so that means that the action is more um, metrical, what is a metrical action? So it's again um, in the words, huh? It's again yeah. in, the, in the words. Yeah. So I think um, I was a little bit um, angry sometimes. Hmm, this conclusion is um, made out of the blue. It doesn't make any sense. It yeah, yeah, just yeah. raises more questions. Yes, exactly. But this is interesting. It's good <laughs> in, in some sense. So it makes it clear that we, we need much more uh, research and especially con contextualization of the sources that deal with staging. And staging is another thing than the, uh, the bodily actions. The also, these two concepts are very often um, interused. Um, uh, yes. Because there were, were they already real stage directors then, um, uh, in those days? Yes and no. They were especially, and also from the sources, it, it feels that um, in the late 16th and early 17th century, um, there were Corrago, which is yeah. in fact an artistic director, and he has also, apart from casting and even finding si financing uh, and, and hiring a costume um, 
makers and in fact, really dealing with, with the whole production of, of the opera. He was also some sort of stage director. Perhaps we should we should shortly say what Il Corago is. It's an anonymous It's an treatise anonymous uh, treatise on, uh, staging, eh? on, on staging. And a Corago um, is in fact another name for an artistic opera director or yeah. um, theatrical director. Who I find it interesting that the, the word job. choreographer is very close to... Huh? I mean, Corago, choreographer. <laughs> so it, it says much more than what the modern uh, uh, term would say, I think, because it's about the, the movement of the body. Yes, and, and, and he really uh, has, uh, in different chapters, talks really about the different parts of, of the body and where to look mm -hmm. in, in what affect and what hand to use. And, and it's, it's incredibly clear. Um, because I also I imagine, Sigurd, that... that with all that information that there is, and you, you mentioned Bonifacio, you mentioned Corago, there is, there's, I mean, books that I don't even know that you just mentioned or sources. Um, it must be an enormous can of worms for the early 17th century, because in contrast to, for example, I don't know, Handel's London or even Opera Seria as a whole in Europe in the second half of the 18th century, we don't deal yet with an established genre. I mean, Francesca and Tim describe a one-time event uh, this, this, this Euridice, not even by one composer. Uh, that's why there is no Peri or Caccini in the title of their books, um, of their of their book, which is an, a first attempt to do something. I mean, what does that tell us about Orfeo by Monteverdi in Mantova? What tells us about Rossi in in Rome? I mean, there is a whole. Of, and then, of course, uh, what does that tell us about commercial opera as, it, and, as they started in Venice and, and in, in, the, in the 30s of the 17th century? So, are, are there any generalized principles at all that can be... Oh, yes. I think it is, it is especially this uh, new idea of mettre in scene una favola. Mm -hmm. uh, and if this is uh, later in an... Um, I mean, after 1637, uh, in, a, in a commercial setting or in a Barberini setting with only religious um, themes in, yeah. in, in Rome um, or in Florence. It is already since um, what we see with uh, the Intermedi in the Medici's around the end of the 16th century, um, this um, curiosity and this um, new um, display of putting a, a dramatical story in a vi uh, in, in a visual uh, the metre in in Shena, so to make it not only audible but also uh, visible. Mm -hmm. And I think in that sense they are all connected, um, and they are very very much based on uh, the principles of um, visual display in the uh, in the Roman uh, or uh, oratoria tradition, and from there um, they are in fact all connected. Um, I. I do not think that um, you can you can say oh, it is totally different in Venice than in Rome. And they all start from the same urge to be uh, able that the eye is as much um, uh, moved by the music and by the text, especially than the only the ear. And the difference there were there would be would be what every uh, orator knows. Um, the virtues of, of eloquence, uh, uh, that aptum, uh, you have to use the appropriate gestures and words for the appropriate, for the, for the appropriate situation. So it's, it's how... Yes, because, um, I mean, Eredice is a court situation, but in yes, Corazzone but di Papea, for example, is a completely commercial situation. But that doesn't um, change anything on staging. On the princes, but on on the principles of uh, st standing right, acting with the right hand uh, for oh, positive okay. things, and acting with the left hand for negative things. Positions in front of the stage, in the back of the stage, m uh, using half circles, the way of entrances, the the way of chorus work. Um, it doesn't that, that doesn't make any any sense, uh, any yeah. difference. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the of course the the subject that yeah, is yeah. that is quite different, and of course the more um, it is also. Um, the difference could could have been as more private you are, the more time you have, and the more the corago has um, uh, a place to control and to just make sure that all the aspects are in a very good balance mm -hmm. and not according to his idea, but according to the rules that 
just like in 17th century opera, are getting to be established bit by bit. Yeah. So they still have to be learned or to be uh, guided by a corago or by some sort of stage director. Okay. And towards the, the 18th century, these That's principles... a ceremony master, actually. A, a sort of ceremony, ceremony master. Yes, indeed. In way, yes. Yes. But then... After a while, just like the genre of opera is very well established, yeah. we don't need that anymore because mm -hmm. all the actors, they are trained in, in the same... Uh, they know the rules, they know the, that's a regelwerk yeah, yeah. Uh, of, of how to, to, to act themselves. On the other hand, uh, I, when, I, when I hear you, um, um, especially a few questions ago when, or a few, a few minutes ago when we talked about... Uh, how difficult it is for a modern stage director, or for a singer, for that matter, who, who wants to do it her mm -hmm. or himself, um, that we have to gather information from so many different sources and to brew our own little pot before you, you can... Um, that, is, that seems to be the case for 18th century theatre as well, as you, as you described. Why is it then so different, or is there any basic difference with this early 17th century? Why have we arrived uh, in our um, music life um, at the point where we have Handel operas on stage, where we have Bononcini, where we have name it, uh, Caldara's even. Huh? No, yeah, we did Caldara. Mm -hmm. But we don't have many Monteverdi's or... or but uh, you mean with, we don't with have... With historical staging. What is the now difference? Now, today? Yeah. I have no idea. You have to ask the organizers <laughs> <laughs> of theatres and festivals. But would it for you, for, you, for example, if you would be invited to stage an, an early 17th century opera, would that be a, a, a thing for you to do in the same way as you do later work? Or if they know Norwegian theatre for that matter? Huh? Of course. Ah. I would, of course, I would, yeah. I would, I would love to do it. But it's not something that you say, oh, we don't know enough about that. Oh, no, not, not at all. On the contrary. Ah, okay. Oh, yes. Then, then I could at last use all the information that is there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. But then, after having done such a production, then would be the moment to report on your experiences and to have, because then you have confronted it with, with the actual yes. act. Um, so there is nothing much to say in advance on it, except for no, and possible sources. Yes, and that is a little bit the, the difficulty with, um, um, with research in that field. Um, if you have, as a stage director or somebody who is then the Corago in, yeah. in a production. Yeah. If you do not have that opportunity to go, to really go to an end result, um, it is not always, um, you know, you don't start just diving into the sources umsonst. Uh, I do it when I teach, uh, but I mean, this is done only a, a little bit. So, in fact, I'm very often waiting until uh, a certain <laughs> demand comes to, to do a production, this and that, and then, then I say, wow, now I dive into this or into that um, source material there is, oh yes. Um, so, the, the, I, d I really don't know why um, until now, except in France, there have been a lot of Lully, um, of course, um, done in, in last, uh, last year, a lot of Moliere, uh, of course, because of the commemoration um, year. Um, so that really gives opportunity to deep uh, diving into archival um, evidence, not only on acting, but also on costumes and on spaces and on lighting techniques and things like that. Um, but for 17th century, there is, uh, for early 17th century, there is not so much. And no. this also gives me another idea because there are many, for us musicians, there are these, these, these uh, beginner's books, uh, the um, a musician's companion to mm -hmm, the performance mm -hmm. practice of 18th century, of 17th century music. But mm -hmm. su such a thing would be very difficult yes. to write for, s for everything that is connected to staging, I suppose. No, I think um, uh, it is one of the things that have to be written uh, as urgent as possible. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so, some sort of... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> because this is something that, that we really need. There is um, a French book from Michel, Michel Verschave, um, already written. It's an old in, book. It's an old book, um, where um, different sources are put together, um, especially French ones. Um, but this is really something that, that, that could be incredibly helpful. And what um, would you expect then to find in such, a, in such a book? I mean, well, this is actually the question, what kind of research needs to be presented also to, to um, uh, 
to people, to, to singers who want to engage in it? What, what, what sort well, of... Well, first, first of all, that it is a compendium that um, reunites all that scattered information. Mm -hmm. And so that would make it possible for much more people who do not dive into although there is a lot on the internet available now, <laughs> um, but who, who get more than um, a bibliographical list, but really um, some sort of compendium of different... Uh, sources. Of all, of all the, diff uh, the different sources. Um, and also with their translations. We are waiting already um, very long for the English translation of Corago. Yeah. Andrew Lawrence King has uh, published it, the annou has announced it already a long time on his website that he's going to do it. It's not there yet. I mean, I read Italian, but many cannot read Italian. And so that would um, be um, uh, yeah, in incredible, um, uh, important. And um, I think once you have... Um, books that gather all that information, then we could also start much easier to um, research about different national styles, which is not done at all. I mean, it is apparently a difference between an Italian opera, a French opera, an English opera. Um, uh, is there is there um, um, a difference? Yeah. Is there information that? Or is there a difference because um, when when the Italians started with Italian opera, there was nothing else. Eh? Of course. Uh -huh. So that would be uh, very interesting to have <laughs> to have that um, to see all that com that information a little bit gathered together, mm -hmm. uh, with or without uh, um, um, translations, and then um, the other thing um, uh, that could emerge is that we would learn much more of the use of body language or gesture in general in non-theatrical uh, situations when there was, um, you know, I sing in cantatas, oratorias, um, in churches, in chambers, in, in other situations. So that would interest me a lot um, to know yeah. Uh, to find out what to, happened. To I find okay. out what yeah. if it happened uh, or uh, if it d didn't happen. My personal impression is that, that whenever a singer was given a sheet of paper in her or his hands, he was not meant to act, or vice versa. If he was not meant to act, they gave him a sheet of paper in the, in, in the hands. Well, I would like to know more about that myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are even... Um, I mean, and that's another aspect uh, that we need to research much more um, is uh, all the iconographical uh, information that we have. For example, just because you tell uh, there, there are uh, pictures of singers who have a piece of paper in the left hand and who and make still a speak with the right hand. With the yeah. right hand. Of Without course. speaking with the right hand. <laughs> well, is it speaking or yeah. uh, is it just an iconographical uh, tool to make uh, clear that, that because the mouth isn't open yeah. that the person is speaking? Yeah. Uh, making a gesture, just like you see in dance um, um, pictures, for example, that the moment that a dancer has uh, this um, hand movement, it means he's a dancer and not a, and a singer, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that is something that we um, really uh, should um, mm -hmm. research much more. Wow. It would also be incredibly interesting to make an overview of uh, all the staging um, information that we find in scores. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. <laughs> because there is a lot there. Staging information that we find in prompt books, mm -hmm. uh, in libretti. And so try to find out the staging rules, um, not only in 18th century uh, music, but also in 17th century music. Because nowadays um, these, these kind of sources are only gathered in function of one specific production, I, I yes, suppose. Uh, yes. So there is no... Uh, oh, that's interesting. And w um, because I can imagine that this is especially important for singers who, 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 who will then be on stage. But would you also say that this is uh, of general importance for musicians who perform 17th and 18th century, I mean, in general, not only the singers. Um, oh, yes, definitely. And this is something that I feel very often also in uh, productions that are not with a big orchestra, but made in a, in a chamber um, um, besetzung. Um, yeah. I just did, for example, uh, with the students of the conservatory in, in Brussels, um, the singing class of Nicole, Nicola Achten, um, um, a whole week uh, work and a lot of Ricitar cantando. Mm -hmm. And it was so beautiful to see how um, suddenly this 
all the instrumentalists who are looking at the stage and not looking at the director anymore musically, but seeing what was happening and being inspired and changing everything, phrasing uh, the, ho the whole um, rhythmical uh, display of what they were doing uh, just by looking at an acting singer. Yeah. Um, and it is it is broadening their their uh, concept of the music what they do of the the music that they play. That they perform it's that. Um, suddenly they do not play the notes anymore or beautiful music, but mm -hmm. they play theatrical music, yeah. uh, and that makes a difference, mm -hmm. which is sometimes so audible. Um, you know, they they do it the first time, and then they they look at at the singer and. That was of course sound. a rhetorical question, eh? because it's it's obvious. I mean, if I if I remember myself playing French dance music after having worked with yeah, dancers, I mean, with you, I mean, what a difference it makes. Eh? Um, and it's it's also very uh, interesting to see that sometimes when I ask certain things or I give uh, information around. Uh, um, a certain phrase or a certain effect or a certain rhetorical device to use um, in the body then um, that a musical director then just translates it in musical terms to his ensemble <laughs> yeah. which is just the same mm -hmm. it's only an, another another metier it's a musical I mean yeah. instrumental metier and uh, the body um, so um, the craft is another medium it's another medium but it is totally the same That's and it. to have this this um, Constant connection between between the two is so enriching. Yeah, mm -hmm. it makes no. it makes a, a, a whole difference. Mm -hmm. And we have talked for a very long time. I don't know if there if there are things that you would like to add yourself um, that we haven't tackled, um, because somehow from the starting point of, of Francesca's and Tim's book on. Uh, and 17th century, we, we have covered <laughs> the problem, what is, or the problem, the whole field of what is staging of opera mm -hmm. and uh, what is it in, in a whole, what is the importance of it, both for the uh, audience, performers and all that, and what is missing if we want to um, find out more for early 17th century uh, practices. Huh? That's, that's a bit what we have covered. Yes. Is there well, th the other thing that is missing in the, um, when we're talking about what is missing is um, in the pedagogical system of early music. Uh, we have everywhere, um, you know, early music singing, but the, um, and sometimes here and there already a class for gesture. Um, and every musicological department of early music um, try to do in the end of the year a production. <laughs> um, and that is wonderful because they also have gesture. But the moment you put something on stage, um, it is not enough to know, for example, how to play uh, in the right way on, on a violin, but you need a right bow and uh, you need all the right build of the instrument. So we need costumes, we need a raked stage, we need lighting from the sides, etc. because all that makes our sound. And then all the institutions of early music, they don't have a department for opera. And that is really something that is so missing. Um, and then we tend um, we tend with um, yeah to end with a nice result made in a week and a half time for a musical piece that is about two hours long, um, and it's all cute and it's all nice and at least the students who have had. Um, some some um, teaching in gesture, at least they can use it yeah. for once. <laughs> um, but there is so much missing. It's scratching um, the surface. Yeah. It's really scratching the surface, mm -hmm. and and everything that is around it. And I don't, don't I really honestly don't understand why uh, the regular department of lyrical music, be it uh, in, in whatever conservatory, many many of them have an opera department mm -hmm. and produce. Um, like six productions a year, and there is a whole production um, um, backing <laughs> to do that. And uh, in early music, it isn't. Mm -hmm. Until now, I do not know one institution for early music in Europe, and not even in the stage, who has an opera department. It would be interesting. To and at the same time, now we feel, uh, we see that everywhere on stage, there is not only Handel anymore. I mean, no, no, we hear Hasse and Porpora and Chesti mm -hmm. and Cavalli, and it's all there. Um, but in the establishment of uh, pedago pedagogy, it is absent. And that is um, a big missing point. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's a strong statement at <laughs> the end. Um, 
There is time for questions, which, by the way, you could also formulate in German. And, and it's, uh, I think we're open to German here in Cologne. Yeah? <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for the very interesting discussion. Um, two things, actually. Uh, first, um, maybe I'd like to, uh, I'd like to um, explain to you a, a, a project that's currently working at the Folkwang University in Essen. Um, we're trying to construct a, a database of um, primary sources for uh, historically informed uh, musical practice. And obviously it will take some time, uh, um, at least two, one or two years until it goes online. And uh, maybe that project might be of interest to you f uh, uh, when it's finished or at least when it's, uh, it's gone online. And uh, secondly, the, qu the question that uh, follows is, um, do you have some kind of uh, a list for, for uh, primary sources that you've, w w that you've been working with, extra musical primary sources? Because we are always, always looking for more sources that, that we could include into the database. My lists are ex extensively <laughs> present in my computer. <laughs> Uh, yes, I do. Of course, they, they are all um, concerned with gesture, staging, um, and, and sometimes this is also spoken theatre, of course, or public speech, so not only, not only music, but um, my bi I, I can just send you bibliographical lists um, endlessly. Yes. That would be very kind, <laughs> because... Uh yeah, we, we do have our own uh, list, but maybe it's not co as comprehensive as, as yours, and maybe we can add But it is, it is something that, uh, as, as I mentioned also before, what are the, the research that we still, still need? We need a good database. Um, and uh, every, every of my colleagues, they have their databases, their, our lists, um, um, but this is really something that we, that we should all add in an existing database like yours um, or create our own. The difficulty is that um, staging, historical staging, uh, everything that is, um, yes, from before the 18th century or before 1800, does not have really a place in um, research um, beyond uh, you know, for for stage directors and or uh, for in even in in um, uh, Theaterwissenschaft. Um, it is it is um, it. This was how it was before, but the real research st starts later, <laughs> um, and it doesn't always um, in musicology. It doesn't really have a place. It's a little bit sometimes like with with dance research. There are not really uh, dance departments of dance, dance Geschichte. Um, so you always have to find um, a discipline where you can put your, your information uh, in. And so it would be interesting to, um, to fill up your database with um, things that have to do with, with musical staging, yes. Another question by um, Professor Tuhenschel, yeah? Yeah. Um, well, it's not a question really, uh, it's just in support of what you were telling. Um, uh, I just came across the description, you probably know it, uh, of the staging of um, the Ballo delle Ingrate by, by Monteverdi from Folino. And uh, uh, he gives so interesting information about the gestures uh, of the dancers. Uh, I was looking for information about how um, the expressive, uh, what was the expressive idea of the, that dance? And I think the description of the costumes and the gestures uh, was very important for me to understand this. So um, I can well, very well understand the relevance of the sources you mentioned. Dr. Packer had also had a question, I think. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for this um, very enlightening uh, discussion. I have a follow-up uh, on the database as well, because of course, if you're uh, just putting together um, sources, people will be overwhelmed by the, just by the numbers. So I think uh, when we did something like that um, in, in other fields, it's important to also establish keywords and maybe a, a source reader that's more directed towards some of the subjects that could be um, drawn from um, this source. So the database in itself is probably not really helpful 
for, for users unless you have a tool that opens up um, aspects um, uh, for, for, for research because many people don't know the keywords or don't mm -hmm. understand how to use them. So uh, just having a database, it's just sitting there like in a, in a library, it doesn't really work. So we need um, knowledgeable researchers who know the keywords and to um, bring the things together. And this is a problem for musicologists um, as well because um, the training is so much philological um, uh, uh, or based on editing that um, there is a new uh, branch of musicological research which is called Interpretationsforschung, although that's what early music people have done for all, the, uh, for, for, for all their lives. But um, in musicological traditions of the post-war, at least German-speaking uh, tradition, it seemed to be the business of practical musicians. So uh, there's a lack of, uh, of training for musicologists to at least have an eye for stage directing information in, um, uh, in editing uh, the, the scores um, and all of this other information. There is a need for musicologists to be trained for relevant information to, to, to look at and uh, organize and analyze uh, information relevant to performance. And on that note, I, I believe we have to stop here because is it 10.35? Is that the end of the the official end of the session or do we, do we have more time because there are more remarks i think uh, uh, I yeah i don't know whether i'm moderator still or not right, right now but i think the question in front yes of was quite early so we should <laughs> uh, i'm so sorry i missed that excuse it's, me it's okay it's fine uh, again a very enlightening talk with both of you um i just wanted when you said about scratching the surface in terms of from the musical standpoint uh, the many hidden things uh, in music that our audiences don't are not aware of, uh, especially with the theater. It's an 18th century aesthetic that's lost. And I just wonder when you direct or a, a piece, if you try to maybe present some of these things, for example, in Mozart, the keys are very important, uh, the instrumentation for sexuality, for hidden, uh, there's hidden meanings that we talked about, emotions that, and modern directors don't get this at all. They just miss it, they even ignore many things that are in the score, which is a disaster. But just what, you or we can do to make these a little more evident. For example, in Baroque music, most of the arias are in dance forms that they were very familiar with people. People knew when they would hear an aria that's a passicale or, or a, a minuet, a gig or whatever, they immediately would pick up. There's many, many references that are completely lost today. And uh, when you stage something, if you perhaps maybe use something to perhaps present that a little more, that it's a little more evident what's behind the scenes that were uh, in the, in the uh, in, the, in an aria or, for, or when you're staging, staging something. Because these are things that have to be taught or I think presented in such a way that people become, it becomes part of their normal diet, their, uh, their understanding. Yes, my experience is that you can do that in two ways, or you overact and you try to make it almost uh, in a pedagogical way. You see, this is really what is, um, what maybe you don't know anymore, but so that means, for example, there is an aria, but somebody will be d dancing a minuet in the background. You can do that. Um, and sometimes here and there, I have done that, just to make, to make that clear. Um, but once you, um, uh, you really stage in a historical way, <laughs> it is not necessary to do that. Because um, when this aesthetic is um, not only in the, in the sound, but in uh, for the eyes the whole time there, it is self-evident. And you don't have to explain it anymore. And the other thing is with all these dance arias, especially in, 18, in 18th century operas, um, once the contact with the orchestra, with the musical director, is established in that way, it is clear that it is a dance. <laughs> Um, the other thing is when you have um, operas where you have dance, which is a really Baroque dance, I mean, in, in, and not modern dance, which is also sometimes done. Um, and when the singers feel the whole time connected to these movements on stage uh, and connected with the aesthetics of their own movement, um, it becomes so self-evident um, that um, all these things do not have to be explicitly um, explained or over over dramaturgically shown um, it's difficult to to um, to prove that but this is most of the time how it works the moment um, I have staged things where um, they have been asking me please can you write an ABC of gesture and of all these um, 
um, dramaturgical uh, other meanings that we do not know anymore today so that the audience understand. Okay, some years ago I did that and I wrote and, and of course half of the people do not read that before the performances but many do and what is interesting, interesting afterwards they can refer to it. Um, and uh, that was on the one side and on the other side I have been staging um, I just did a Telemann opera in an, in, in an opera building uh, and, and in a city where um, they are not interested in historical performance whatsoever. And it was not announced like that. So all non-initiated, um, non only non-initiated people came there and they understood everything. Um, so I, I think that when, when all the noses in, are in the same direction of light and of costume and of stage, say, stage setting and the, con the correlation between what's happening in the pit uh, and what's going on on stage is, and, and the whole staging itself and the whole gesture language, when it's there, everything you talk about becomes self-evident and um, people understand it. I agree with you. I'm just happy to hear that that's actually happened. So oh, yes. I've oh, not it, experienced it, it, it really does. Yes. I think we have to stop here. And I'm not sure, do we have a break now? Oh, yeah. So we have a break and we, 15 minutes. And so we continue in 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter.
Hello and welcome back to our symposium research day, um, Beyond the Score. I would like to invite now Professor Helmut Kova, and first I want to thank him for jumping in on a rather short notice to replace another speaker who could not attend, so thank you very much for, for, <laughs> for doing that. Um, Helmut Kova uh, studied violin at the University for Music and Performance Arts in Vienna, Musicology, History of Art and Law at the University of Vienna, 1978 PhD graduation, 2002 habilitation. Between 1985 and 1990, he was a substitute violin at the Vienna State Opera Orchestra and at the Vienna Philharmonic. Um, between 1979 and 2018, he was staff member of the Phonogram Archiv of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and between 2012 and 18, the director of the Phonogram Archiv. Since 1984, he is lecturing at the University of Vienna Institut for Musikwissenschaft. Thank, Thank you. you very much for these kind words. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'd like to present to you some maybe unknown things. I hope so. <laughs> I'd hope so. Yeah. And as, as a kind of introduction, I would like to mention that as early as 1775, we find some concern for the performance of music, of old music. It was Pierre Angramel who published a book on the art of transforming music onto the barrels of self playing organ works. And there, in his foreword, he regrets that no instruments and barrels were made at the times of Lully, Rameau, Couperin, etc., which would have kept the way these masters had played their music. Thus, the knowledge on the performance practice of their times is, sadly enough, limit, limited to narratives, as he states. That's an interesting statement. With my first topic, I would like to uh, refer to so-called free rhythmic elements. Uh, this is an art cabinet, the so-called so Wallbaum cabinet, because it takes its name from Matthäus Wallbaum, who is said to have made the silver decorations of the cabinet. It was made circa 1620 to 1625, most probably in Augsburg. It incorporates a mechanical organ work with two ranks of wooden pipes, and the barrel is made from wood and pierced metal pins and bridges. Here you can see the two uh, rows of pipes, and you see the claves and the barrel, and the motor here, the spring motor. And we find on this barrel, I go to the next. On this barrel we find, uh, and that's its most interesting for the music, we find uh, that the surface of the barrel is covered with a net of lines. We find transversal lines which divide the surface into 30 sections, each section subdivided by lines into four parts. And we find 30 four circular lines, they mark the tracks of seven tones of the two musical pieces which they are notated. In my transcription, I mark the sections as dotted lines and as you will see, the music noted on the cylinder is not bound to the net of lines. That's a surprise. There's the transcription and you find those vertical lines Maybe you can find them like here. Or here. Or here. The first piece starts with an initial phrase with its first tone already placed before the beginning of section one. The rhythmical succession of the tones then is almost formed as a triplet and on the quarter rest is shortened. The following piece starts with a motif in an even meter, but remarkably enough, 
The pins are not set within the line patterns to the bell. The musical measures are slightly longer than the sections. With section seven, six, seven here. Can you see? Yeah, six, you find six and measure seven. And this on the, the next one. Uh, we find uh, some kind of rhythmically free improvisation de level, developing. The chords are not played simultaneously. I try to show that by positioning the notes in a different way. This comes first, this comes first, then this comes first, then this comes first. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It displays a flowing run and ends up in a single voice cadenza. You see a single voice cadenza and on ending on the note A. Then some kind of postlude is attached which, which closes the piece. It is gracefully set mu melodic line in even meter with clear rhythmical structure and its measures correspond exactly, now exactly, with the, the line pattern on the barrel surface. With the last chord, we find a feature to be observed with many examples of music on automata of that time. The four chords, uh, the, the four tones of the chord, you may count, yeah, are brought to an end at different points of time. In other words, the chord is thinning out towards its very end and is finished on the lowest tone. Quite interesting to notice, no, uh, to note these uh, uh, pauses. As one can easily see, the line pattern only partly served as a musical measure or bar and does not match with the musical structure of many parts of the piece, revealing a free rhythmical flow in the first half of the music piece. I may play this music played by this instrument carefully restored in 2013. <laughs> music from that time. So, we have another art cabinet. I would like to uh, discuss also with this art cabinet some details. Um, with this art cabinet, uh, we find incorporated a spinet, a mechanical spinet made by Biedermann in Augsburg. Uh, we have six pieces on the barrel, and we may find a feature which already Ton Kopman noticed with a spinet by Biedermann, which is kept in the Germanisches Nationalmuseum uh, in Nuremberg. He called it, or it is called, I don't know who brought all, or up this term, uh, the so called Oberlegator. That means that in a succession of tones, two, three, or even more tones, each tone is held somewhat longer and is still sounding when the following note is already played. Tones flow in each other, notably in the accompaniment of the fourth piece. It is a constitutional uh, feature. We look at the fourth piece and
Then we have, uh, for instance, the fifth piece, where you also find a uh, uh, le obbligato, especially with the, with the bass notes, uh, which flow over to the next. For instance, very uh, good uh, uh, to see in the last uh, uh, line of the bass section. Um, unfortunately, there exists no uh, recording. Uh, it was done, it was uh, restored in 2007, and I urged to do a recording, but the then director of, these, of, the, of, the, of the collection didn't like that. I don't know why. Meanwhile, uh, I think the spring is broken and the cord is broken, and hmm, I had the chance. I was, I was I had the chance to listen to it when it was finished, and I have to confess. And every other say, "Well, it sounds awkwardly. This, this, so many dissonances. Of course, yeah, yeah. So maybe he didn't like it, so he didn't record it. Maybe that's my." very bad uh, idea to this. So, number six, you find again these buildings, these over legato in mostly in the past section, but as a contrast you find also very short held notes. This ma makes a very good impression. I, I, I really love this piece. So maybe it will come to, to life again. With the following examples, I would like to uh, come to the aspect of articulation and ornamentation. At first, I would like to give an example, very new, coming from the cymbal and flute work incorporated in the writing cabinet from 1776, 17, owned, uh, made by David Röntgen in Neuwied, famous maker of Möbels, and the clockwork and the musical movement were made by Peter Kinzing and uh, by Wilhelm Weil. This famous piece of furniture had been bought by Prince Karl Alexander, then the governor of the Netherlands, for his, uh, for his uh, residence in Brussels. From that it came later on uh, to Vienna. The, move, the musical movement cons consists of a symbol with 24 uh, tones. There you find, with the left picture, you find the hammers. And uh, the symbol was totally missing. And two thirds of the um, pipes were missing. It was interesting and I was uh, asked to find out the tuning of, of, the, of the symbol. That was not 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 so not so difficult because uh, as it is harmonically correct music, you you have a starting point and you have an end point, and then you find out uh, the positions and so on. It, it, it was it's it's a, it's a nice play. It's it's like crossword. Uh, so and I, I gave my, my, my findings to the restorer. I'm not a restorer. Gave the restorer and, and she, a lady in Vienna, she, you see at the right time, with the symbol fixed uh, to this whole mechanism. I show you, it plays on, uh, there's a barrel playing four uh, melodies. I show you melody number two. Uh, it's uh, the slowest one, and you can detect. Uh, uh, you can detect uh, in which way the decorations are attributed to different, different notes, and you may also detect that uh, the trills, the shakes, are starting with the main note. Yeah, and. Uh, it is so. It is rather slow, so I could really write out every every uh, ornamentation. With the others, they are so uh, um, much faster, so it's difficult to do that. 
are very nice. It was uh, restored perfectly. Uh, the symbol, on, symbol is not damped, yes? So I adjusted the, the notation of, for the symbol accompanying the flute melody uh, to the flute melody values. Yeah. It's a typical gallant music of that time and you could get a good impression how to play such a lovely music, a flute accompanied by a harpsichord, by a keyboard instrument. you may uh, notice that uh, the articulation of the flute part is designed uh, uh, in detail, meticulously. All notes are played quite short, but in bar one and three, the eights are legato, bound, two and two. That means the second eight is shortened. But when the passage is repeated, all notes are played staccato. We also find in bar six and uh, six to bound, 16 notes. In the repetition, these notes are played staccato again. And in bars seven and eight, we find an alternation between slurred and separated notes. All those patterns of articulation are maintained when the passages are repeated. So it becomes clear that it was meant to do it that way. Uh, that's not a simple or a, a single uh, a singing example to study. I counted. There exist quite a number of instruments of that kind by different methods. But merely from the Röntgen workshop, I counted 12 clocks with music works of that kind, kept in the well-known collections, and there are still some unknown pieces in private possession. Each instrument has up to seven barrels each barrel playing at least one tune, mo but most playing four tunes. You can easily imagine the amount of music available, a real treasure unveiling the musical taste and the way of performing in the second half of 18th century. So it's up to the researchers to find out. In order to dec discuss uh, some details, Details. I will turn now to the flute clocks, which play music especially composed by Joseph Haydn for these instruments. There exist two flute clocks signed and dated by Pater Primitivus Niemitz, a priest and curator of the library of the Esterhase court, a colleague of Nheim Haydn. He was himself a musician and a composer, and he took lessons with Haydn. And most important, he was a technical gifted man constructing, constructing mechanical organ works. So he had not much to do as a priest or as a curator of the library. Uh, the musical expression takes uh, place uh, within a strict temporal frame, not allowing any agogics. One could say that on principle all notes values are shortened extremely. Most noticeable is the shortening of the tone values at the end of phrasing, motifs, or at the end of pieces. Uh, first I would like to show, this is, this is the housing of such a um, flute clock. This is the flute clock, the music machine, the barrel, 
the, uh, the machine, the spring work, pardon, I didn't want to do that. So, and the bellows behind. And if you look, there's one missing. I wanted to show you uh, the pipes which are lying underneath, horizontally. You don't see them. That was a typical Czech uh, uh, feature. In Vienna, they didn't do that. And Niemens came from Czech. So, uh, as to the shortening of nodes, uh, with the Hoboken uh, group 19, number 17, uh, we find a good example on shortening all, world, all node values as uh, uh, extremely. The quart, uh, if you look at this uh, first example, the quarter node, the uh, half node, uh, the, 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 the quarter node, the, the, the eighth nodes, and the sixteenth nodes, uh, as written by Haydn, are, pli are played or are represented on the barrel by single pins. They are all long, not longer as a As, 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 as they are really very, very short. And, uh, but the impression is a little bit others. Maybe I can. It's an, uh, I think, uh, I say it now, it's experimental music, of course. It's of course. Uh, number nine is more striking, it's a minuet, and with this passage I show you here, all nodes are only noted as pins, only the half node, which is bound to the next quarter node. As you can see with these uh, examples here, one can say that phrasing was obviously a, an open field. With, with each piece of those flutes, flute clocks, we find different articulations. And most, most interesting, neither Niemetz nor Wiest did follow what had been written by Haydn. We have five uh, instruments, two by Niemetz signed, two by Niemetz unsigned, and the next was Johann Josef Wiest, who made also uh, an instrument playing Haydn's music. So, uh, neither of them followed the articulation Niemitz, uh, Haydn had written down. I had a discussion with Sonja Gerlach on this point because she somehow was very unhappy about the fact that these sources from Haydn's times, from, from Niemitz, made according to Haydn's ideas, etc., that these pieces did not play what the master uh, prescribed. It was, one could, one, one could say, or well, this could lead us to the conclusion that Haydn's phrasing 
could be regarded as some kind of proposal to be followed or not to be followed. And as you see, not to be followed. A good example you find here in uh, uh, number L, 11, bars 2 to 7. Uh, that's good because we have uh, three different clocks playing the same piece. And you see, you can easily find out what Haydn wrote. What Haydn wrote, that's printed. And what Teubner and Wiest played. Teubner is the unsigned Wiest clock and the 17, uh, 1793 clock, what these instruments play. Uh, and uh, when these uh, phrases are repeated, maybe in those uh, accentuations and phrasings are changed again. Let's listen to two of them. <laughs> to uh, two, just two kind of ornamentation. It's surprisingly how often Haydn uses arpeggios. Uh, to play an arpeggio means uh, that the sound becomes louder and it becomes broader, but it's very short. It's it was called dry in the literature. Yeah, it's very short and he used it in different uh, positions. Uh, first, you see with the number 28, it, he used uh, arpeggios with the final chords. Nothing special, but he, he does this very often with four pieces. Then, with three pieces, he uses uh, arpeggios uh, in the course of cadenzas somehow highlighting this uh, harmonic structure uh, and giving it more room, but very short. It's very interesting to listen to that. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Very inventive, really very inventive. And he uses arpeggios uh, in a thematically relevant function. Mostly at the beginning of pieces, you see that in number 11, also in number 12 and 27. Uh, by doing this, he's providing some kind of accent uh, without uh, disturbing the flow of the piece. Uh, I would like to come uh, to that's again the same. Yes, that's better. Uh, in number 27, we find uh, arpeggios used as a kind of coloristic effect. Uh, if you, you look at that one, or that one, multi-voiced uh, chords, really made for the automaton. Uh, and there you can notice that with the end chords, he also, uh, he also adds a major seven chord note, but only when he plays an arpeggio. Uh, there are pieces which he also wrote without arpeggio. There this seventh uh, note is missing, of course. But when it's, uh, when it's written as an arpeggio, he uses that. That's giving some ah, typical effect. No, not playing. Sorry. So then we come to the another another ornament to the more than. Uh, that's in a really interesting fact about the more than. Uh, it's number fifteen. Uh, and there Haydn uses a mordant. The composition does not exist in Haydn's own hand, but in the manuscript by Haydn's copist Elsler. But Haydn added a footnote there, yeah, saying uh, that every time the theme comes and this half note is played, a half mordant has to be applied to it. It comes 46, 46 times. And that is a special thing with this more dance. Because uh, we look at the bit uh, on the pinning of uh, the clock from 1793, there you have the more than with there is the chi, yeah? But it's not interrupted. There is no alternation between G and F sharp. The F sharp is somewhere else on the other side of the barrel. Yeah? It is uh, the way he plays there, or has it played there, expressly as Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach says, that this is a special way of playing a very fast modern. There are two ways, one real alternation between main node and lower node, and main node uninterrupted, and for a very short time, the lower node added. And with this clock, uh, it's played very, uh, the, the very fast. Thank you. 
you. I need some more pictures. Ah, they are not all pictures on the on the do you have a I'm saying good finger thoughts. Thanks, yeah. Ja, mal so ganz schnell durch. <lacht> ja, dann ist so, jetzt bald ja. hoffentlich noch. Ja, jetzt, ja. Tada. Okay, thank you so much. Bravo. So, uh, that's uh, the beginning of a fugue with the unsigned instrument by Niemitz. And there, Niemitz uh, makes a true alternation. Yeah, you see here there, G, and then there's nothing <laughs> for a moment. And then there's again G. And in this intermission, on the other side of the barrel where the F sharp sounds, the F sharp is sounded. So Nimitz could do both. But without intermission, the deception is perfect. And with this piece, it's interesting to notice, it's number 15, uh, that uh, it's also it's, it's, it's an, a, a copy by Elsler. And the copy by Elsler uh, is played by the 1793 clock without, uh, without. But here, you see, he plays, oh, pardon. The Haydn copy by Isla is, is given with, without any ornaments, yeah? But the 1793, uh, Nimitz added uh, more than, and zwar that of the very short kind, and the undated clock also adds this kind of more than. You have to listen very carefully. You have to listen to these things 10 times, 20 times, and every time to listen to it, you find more details. So it never gets boring. with some ideas and observations on tempo. Uh, if you look at the tempo, at the aspect of tempo uh, regarded in regard to musical automata, one has to distinguish between the following groups. First, music which had been composed for musical automata and arrangements of other music to be played by automata. With the other music, which was composed for music automata, we have to distinguish between ordinary music, like dances, keyboard music, and the like, composed to be played by music or clocks, organ works. For instance, the pieces by Handel, by Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, Leopold Mozart, Beethoven, 
world, quite ordinary music, nothing special. And the other group of especially composed works using, applying the technical possibilities or exploring the ex technical possibilities of these mechanical instruments. And I would call this part, I would call experimental music. And it was, and these were designed by Haydn, Mozart, and later on by Stravinsky, Hindemith, Toch, Anteil, Nankero, and so on. In regard to tempos, only the ordinary music is of interest. The other experimental music often uses high speed as a special acoustic effect, enabling new, unusual and new listening experience, thus providing a quality that could not be produced by hand-played instruments. As you can see from the Haydn pieces, they offer such a dense musical texture, and every time you listen to it, you will detect new, unheard details. Of course, a high speed also was used as a kind of show effect as well, certainly. And then we have the group of the extremely great numbers of arrangements of concert music, chamber music, opera, keyboard music, dance music, played by flute clocks, by automatic pianos, by music box, and so on and so on. If we look for the proper playing speed, we should be certain about the th fact that the instrument is in good or perfect playing condition. And as with the flute clocks, the air brake, the fan, yeah, is adjusted to a push position which allows a good and stable sound also in the long notes and chords. But even then, we will find quite some pieces playing too fast, to our opinion. For instance, Overture to uh, Guillaume Tell, it's much too fast, but people liked it, and so it was put on it, because the long chords are at the ultimate uh, possibility to sound, and therefore the fast passages are very fast. Uh, obviously, also, a quicker tempo was not unusual at that time, and one has to be in mind that it makes quite a difference listening to a piece played by an orchestra in a concert hall or in the opera house, in contrast to listening to that very piece played by a flute clock in your living room without any reverberations. Acoustic circumstances and sound characteristics are essential for perception of speed. And then there also existed some attempts and devices to guarantee the correct playing speed for the pieces. With flute clocks from Viennese makers and from Kaufmann in Dresden, we find the blades of the air brake adjustable to a fixed and numbered scale. Uh, with the next that's a, that's a flute clock, a uh, flute secretaire by Bayer, uh, made exactly in 1819. With the next, you see there the, the, the blades, yes? On the right side, uh, the, the instrument is weight driven, and the blades, the fan, controls the speed. And maybe you can see that. Rim, uh, where you could fix, where you could fix the blades, the position of the blades, and for instance, with number one, the blades when an almost flat position, allowing a fast tempo, and with number five or eight, the blades were in a vertical position, the machine running at a very low speed. With that kind of instruments, the inscription of the barrels gives not only the title of the music piece, but also one or two numbers saying to which position the blades should be set. We find that device also in Strasser's famous mechanical orchestra in St. Petersburg he made in 1804. 
Later on, with the pneumatic actions developed end of 19th century, speed control became a basic feature with orchestrans and automatic pianos. Altogether, from listening to music automata, one gets quite some impression on the speed and on tempo relations in former times. Sometimes even surprising indications are to be found. A flute court secretaire made in Vienna, that one, 1819, plays Beethoven's Egmont Overture. Another flute group from about 30 years later also plays this piece. Some details on Egmont. A Beethoven composed his Egmont Overture in 1810, and the overture consists of three parts. Sostenuto, Manon, Tanto. Allegro, Allegro con Brio. In each case, in each arrangement, on the flute work, the they play the full first part and the sostenuto uh, lasts, uh, the full piece lasts about three and a half minutes. With both arrangements, the abbreviations were made within the allegro and the allegro con brio parts. But both instruments play the entire sostenuto part. Both instruments take about one minute for that part. And if you listen to a recording of the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra under the direction of Karajan, you will notice that Karajan needs two minutes for that sustenuto. Well, you may put forward the question in this interpretation, is that still sustenuto, ma non tanto? It's up to you to read those performances. I play for you uh, the rendition by this uh, flute work, 1819, closer to Beethoven, I think, than Karajan, <laughs> just if you look at the time. I really would like to hear that. <laughs> because that's very... Restart. 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 Do you need my, my stick? Ah. Yeah. No. No. Yes, now. Maybe now. Oh. Oh, do you have a stick? The stick, yes, of course. <laughs> Get it to work. No. 
big drum roll. <laughs> Why isn't it working? Mm -mm. But Um, are there any questions in the room? We are kind of over time, so maybe we can. Okay, thank you. Let's let's maybe keep it at that because we are kind of uh, going over time. Thank you very much. We will reconvene at uh, one forty. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
wird und wir sozusagen in die Schlussphase ähm, kommen. Sehr ungewohnt in dem kleinen Saal mit Mikrofon. Ich habe ja immer meine Vorlesung, aber immer ohne Mikrofon. Ähm, ja, und wir haben jetzt noch zwei äh, Teile vor uns. Erst einen Vortrag und dann eine kleine Diskussion. Und ähm, der Vortrag wird gehalten von Kai Köpp, der aus Bern zu uns gekommen ist und der dort Professor für Musikforschung und Kammermusik an der Hochschule der Künste ist, ähm, der aber auch ein äh, Bratschen-Diplom äh, gemacht hat. Gibt ein Problem? Oder? Oh, sorry, I, I, just, <laughs> I, I just had my class in German, so I uh, totally forgot it's too much uh, in, in one day today. Um, I, I repeat the very important things, namely uh, that I'm announcing Kai Köpp's um, uh, lecture, or paper rather, uh, who is professor at the um, uh, University of the Arts in, in Bern, um, where he is professor for um, uh, music, musicology and uh, chamber music. And he also uh, studied uh, viola, um, but is, uh, as far as I understand, uh, mainly active as a researcher with um, like over 80 publications uh, from um, music history with a special focus on um, interpretation research, uh, performance um, re research, um, and uh, so that's also the background for today. And he's the um, editor or author of the uh, Handbuch Historische Orchesterpraxis, and he has done research, uh, for example, on um, the history of performances of Bach, Beethoven, and Wagner. Um, and his um, paper today um, has the title Early Recordings uh, Informed Performance, Historical Embodiment and the Future of Early Music. I'm very much looking forward to it. Thanks. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Yes, uh, early recordings and form performance is um, a newly coined term um, that uh, is related to the term historical informed performance. And we're trying to specify this with a respect to, uh, with a specific respect to early recordings that can um, give us information that we don't have if we only look at written sources. So today I would like to look at three aspects, traces of musical performances in recordings and um, a special way of analyzing these recordings as object-body relations. And thirdly, how to conduct experiments that open up information that um, these non-written sources contain um, for researchers and performers. So I'm starting with traces of musical performance and um, my um, example today is Dvorak's um, American String Quartet, Opus um, 96, the earliest recording was made by um, Paul Hindemith and his brother with his um, uh, Amar string quartet. They recorded the first movement in 1926 um, with an acoustical recording equipment. So just take a listen. Thank you. 
volunteered. Now, uh, this recording is very much unexpected from modern standards because of the flexibility that we can hear, the flexibility of tempo, flexibility of rhythm, and flexibility of intonation or pitch with portamentos. Now, you wouldn't expect this from um, an advanced and modernist uh, string quartet like the Amar Quartet, um, but still they display a lot of um, uh, traditions from the 19th century. And um, if you look at um, how they um, deal with the, uh, with the score, many things that you hear are not written in the score. And I try to mark this um, so that you can hear where they are pushing forward with the tempo, where um, they are uh, looking for uh, sections where there's more calm performance and um, sounds that um, enhance this kind of character. Um, so that the score is really being manipulated by the performers. So this is a historical artifact, something that exists and we need to engage with it. We somehow have to deal with what we're hearing. And uh, this first step is to uh, make sure that your uh, perception um, can repeat what, you, what you're hearing. So that's annotations that guide your listening. At the same time, we're trying to find out whether the things that we hear are intentional and would have been repeated in another performance so that it is part of an active decision that was made by musicians. And one of the strategies that we've been following um, with deciding intentionality, which is a difficult um, uh, subject, is whether this was part of training. And we have been looking in jargon terminology and training, trying to find out how much this was um, a preconceived concept of performance. And in fact, um, we have um, many instruction books um, from the 19th century that are very telling. Here um, is uh, Marian Rankin's uh, memories of her um, teaching or her studies at the Berlin Hochschule für Musik um, with Josef Joachim's class, where she um, explains how they were trained to manipulate the score, looking for um, passages that were pushing forward naturally, and in contrast, looking for um, passages that uh, were calm. And um, this is one way of um, dealing with the many tempo flexibilities um, that we hear in these recordings. It's interesting to see that uh, Marion Rankin doesn't recall ever having heard the term rubato. Um, instead, we have these very technical terms, ruhig und vorwärts, and um, uh, the application of, their, uh, of, of these concepts. We even see that in Willem Mengelberg's scores, where he uses R and W for ruhig und weiter, and we can hear that in his recording. So this is a very widespread concept that we also hear described um, here in earlier recordings and see described in treatises. And this is an interesting aspect that um, um, Sigrid uh, touched upon just before the question of how long these traditions go back. Um, how, uh, and I call this, I use the term long durée. There are some long durées that really date back a long time, and it's very uh, challenging from the sources to find out how something that existed over many generations would still change with fashions or individual choices. So, um, the most important thing here, um, technically or method methodically, is that um, if you have the chance to compare two contemporary recordings, the differences show. So if you think um, the Amar Quartet recording was uh, quite romantic, 
although they have the reputation of uh, being a modernist group. Here we have, two years later, um, a recording by the Bohemian String Quartet in which the um, son-in-law of Dvorak happens to play the second violin, and they were the first to premiere most of uh, Dvorak's uh, late recording, late string quartets. So listen to the same music, but now played by people who are even closer to the original style. <laughs> these two recordings, that would be a method, um, the differences show, and maybe you could um, identify the Amar Quartet's recording as sportive and maybe even almost a caricature of uh, romantic traditions, while you have something that's more tame and more moderate uh, in the Bohemian String Quartet recording. So that would be an issue, a project for a paper or um, an analysis. Um, you have similarities that were probably unconscious um, uh, knowledge that was just around, and then you have decisions. So in interpretation research, we're trying to differentiate between active decisions, intention, something that would be repeated in the next performance, and some things that would, would be repeated but uh, in an unconscious way. Then, of course, we also have other things that what I will talk about. Um, and um, the, the main reason, or the biggest question maybe for modern performers is why do they manipulate the, uh, the score so much? And we talked about that in the last session in um, December in Brussels. Um, again, I was trying to find out uh, about the training, the words that the contemporary musicians use for what they are doing. And it's interesting to see that they have a two-level two concept of professional performance that takes the score only as a starting point. That's um, playing what's in the score was called schöner, uh, correct, uh, correct performance, richtiger Vortrag. And that was a stage for amateurs and beginners. But professional musicians were expected to step, um, go one step further into what's called uh, beautiful performance or schöner Vortrag. And of course, there are many sources about that. And it dates back into um, the 18th century and, and persists into the late 19th century with the same terminology. So that's where the long durée concept is of uh, what a professional performance does with scores even in late uh, romantic scores where there's a lot of notation and you, you think the, uh, the composer takes much more control over the um, decisions. So um, with this preparation, I think um, we can take a quick listen into the um, first movement where you will recognize the flexibility of tempo, of rhythm, and of um, intonation. Listen to this. Thank you. 
Now, this long example uh, is, um, um, the purpose of showing this long example is to get an idea of what beautiful performance was um, um, like in this uh, tradition of performance and how this can be attractive to modern performers in early music and also modern listeners. I know that uh, listeners are very attracted to that kind of playing and they say, oh, I didn't know that this was part of classical music performance or um, they recognize elements of freedom from uh, other genres of music that has been um, lost in classical music traditions. So, and of course, you could try to find out <clears throat> even in more detail uh, of how the portamento goes and um, what exactly happens with tools like the sonic visualizer. And the main part is here to recognize that the professional performance required a deviation from this score, a very significant deviation to make the music more beautiful and to bring a professional training, <clears throat> and not just individuality, but a training to deal with scores into the performances. And in order to find out what really happens, you can, of course, uh, analyze that intellectually, but for performers, it's important to engage with the body. So um, we are dealing with these artifacts from history um, with the body, like in this example with a picture of an archaeotechnician in experimental archaeology trying to find out how to manage um, uh, a bronze axe, a bronze age axe. Um, you can extend information out of artifacts by engaging with your body, because the body reacts in a very specific way to um, the artifact. <clears throat> so in this case, um, we um, looked at uh, recordings uh, for the Weltmenion reproducing piano, which was called the autograph piano in uh, English-speaking countries. <clears throat> Interesting uh, type of source because it doesn't record sound, it records how long the fingers uh, rest on the keyboard. And with this um, uh, recording technology, we get uh, embodied information by pianists. We have the overlegato that uh, we uh, heard from um, uh, the, the previous um, paper where the fingers create an overlapping resonance and things like that. So here's an example of Claude Debussy playing his own um, Danse de Puc and you will find out that he's not playing what's written. Now, if you put that in the sonic visualizer, you get um, a very blurry picture like in this blue representation. However, if you look at the original um, music roll, the piano roll, you get very clear uh, and detailed information. I call this the first digital score because it has on-off information, including the use of pedal, which I highlighted here. These are the two pedal um, lines with on-off pedal. Um, and uh, together with the information of um, uh, having the fingers on the keyboard, you'll find that um, he himself does not play the same um, a slur that he um, put into the score, and he adds arpeggiation. So um, from this um, very little excerpt, we can gather even further information about how the pianist's fingers were acting on the keyboard. Uh, so listen to it once more, and the pianist would now go and imagine fingerings, imagine movement um, to create a specific sound um, that's desired and that you can hear in this artifact. And if you look at uh, the information in the music roll, you see that the chords have very different lengths of the notes. They sometimes overlap. You see in the um, lowest line that they overlap more than in the um, high, higher register. So if you put that into uh, physical playing, there's only one possibility to reconstruct fingerings for this very movement. So you can extract body movements from this very detailed information, the recording information uh, of these Weltmenion rolls. So um, because the information is so detailed, we are in a position to ask very detailed questions in interpretation research. We are trying to differentiate four different parameters, uh, like intentional elements um, and unreflected norms, both of which would have been part of repeated performances. 
Then there's also an element of chance and failure because we don't have any manipulated recordings at that time, so we can um, differentiate here. And that's important because in uh, performance studies, there's a lot of quantitative analysis right now and very little to gain, to gain from in terms of um, um, performance practice because it's purely empiric, which is good, of course, to know what can be measured. But for musicians, we need to get more uh, of, an, of a qualitative information as well. And um, trying to put all the quantitative uh, data in some order is an important step to make sense of um, what musical um, decisions are behind uh, these artifacts that we hear. So um, maybe I have to um, skip this or make it very short. Uh, we can also interact with machines um, in order to extract information from these uh, old artifacts. Here we have only the piano recording of the famous uh, Swan by uh, Saint-Saëns, played by a famous professor uh, of the Royal Academy of Music, Edward Brightwell, in 1909. So listen to the way he plays and imagine you would be adding the missing part. So that's another strategy of um, engaging with these artifacts. So that's very unusual. You would think nobody can play with this. Now, if we have our modern autopilots trying to um, react to cues that we get from accompaniments, this would not work. So it's, I've, I've done this experiment repeatedly, and musicians find if they abandon uh, the expectation of getting cues and trying to get, uh, go along with the information of long phrases, then most of the musicians tell me how revealing and how um, liberating this is to plan long phrases rather than to uh, um, adhere to um, very short distances. And this is a way of getting information that you would not get by pure analysis. You need to engage the body um, of a performer in order to get some information from um, uh, these performances. And um, we're trying to put that into uh, methods of how to collect data uh, that's repeatable and really um, uh, um, scientific. Right, so I, I'm skipping the um, results uh, here, but maybe, uh, no? Well, in order to add the missing cello line, of course, you would have to not only try to play along with um, the old dead professor, but uh, you would also have to try to um, perform in a stylistically appropriate way. And there are many recordings of this piece um, in early recordings because it fits a small um, uh, disc or um, a wax roll. Um, this is an example that shows the flexibility of tempo of pitch and rhythm, um, these standards of beautiful performance. Hello, solo, the swan, played by Hans Krono, Edison Records. This way of playing, this style of beautiful performance of this piece, nobody is looking for cues or precision or vertical precision. I call this vertical precision, which is something that modernist times invented um, as a new aesthetics in neoclassicism, Neue Sachlichkeit aesthetics. But that was uh, a decision that was made in the 20th century, abandoning probably generations of earlier practices. So if you want um, to um, have an example of a modern experiment of a modern cellist trying to um, add uh, a stylistically fitting performance to uh, this piano accompaniment, I will just play you some bars. <laughs> Thank you. 
It doesn't matter if the, both of the musicians don't reach the highest note together, because they create an environment of flow with all the other elements of beautiful performance um, before, the flexibilities of tempo, rhythm, and pitch. So you get a completely new set of aesthetics here that work with this very strange accompaniment. And um, there was no performer who said um, this wouldn't do, and even people who have experience with uh, jazz or with folk music say they can draw on these experiences that still exist in other genres of music. So obviously in the uh, course of the 20th century, classical music got rid of many things that survived in other genres, and that may help bringing it back in um, to reach out to audiences who would expect this kind of um, information um, when they listen to music. Right, so that's, that's um, um, maybe just a preview of uh, the following discussion. My third um, um, chapter here is how to um, engage in these experiments, how to draw knowledge from these artifacts by engaging with a musician's body. Um, that's not in a subjective way, but something that can be done in a scientific setup. So, of course, um, you have a lot of um, uh, disciplines where um, embodiments or reenactments are part of um, serious scientific um, research, like in experimental archaeology, but also um, in criminology or in psychology, where you have to uh, uh, re-engage with uh, traumatizing situations, things like, like that. So there's established uh, methodology for that, uh, that we can apply to musical um, research here. And um, this is another example where I can show you some of the steps. Um, a cello recording from Russia, 1904, St. Petersburg. The former assistant of Davidov plays um, Davidov's Romance Sans Parole, and by now, you will recognize all the elements of beautiful performance. And the question is, how do modern musicians open up the meaning to try to understand the aesthetics, the performance um, decisions made by our colleagues um, 100 years earlier? <laughs> And so on and so forth. So this is how beautiful performance works. It's uh, decidedly not the score. It's something else, but you see the stretching of the dominant chord uh, at the end of phrases in many um, singers' performances. So all of that is standard, and it's uh, expected as um, a technique, something that's repeatable enough uh, and that's taught and where we have jargon words and uh, teaching instructions for to be assured that this is part of something that's planned intentionality. So um, here we have a student reenactment. First, uh, of course, um, the music is analyzed um, uh, with annotations, um, maybe 10, 20 times of analyzing the recording um, with the help of the sonic visualizer if needed. And then some um, different strategies are being represented with different colors. That um, is an, a useful tool of analyzing it. And then in the final stage, trying to um, take the entire body into the analytical process. Uh, like looking at a picture of Alexander Vesbilovich, his uh, posture with the finger, uh, left finger around the neck, which is a very old fashioned uh, violinistic way of, um, of doing it. Um, his bow hold, uh, the arm close to the, um, uh, to the body, and his cello hold, which is quite straight up. Um, so the posture is part of 
the process like an archaeotechnician to try to extract information from this artifact of the early recordings. And this is um, a student example. <laughs> So we established um, a step-by-step -step procedure of how to go from embodying information to reenacting full um, um, movements even of um, early recordings, but not as an artistic process, because imitating is not very artistic. It's really a tool, using the body as a tool to understand the decisions made by performers in earlier times. And these decisions are about um, something that's not to be found in the score. Uh, although there are cues in the score where things are routinely expected to do it in a stylistic context that we can even um, differentiate with different nationalities and different times. But that's the kind of um, tool that we can use um, in order to talk about things that are not written information, unwritten information. Um, I have another example here, but I will skip that as well. This is Joseph Joachim um, playing his own uh, romance we analyzed that in great detail, and also um, the ensemble playing. We developed um, a representation of um, um, the timing and the t tempo flexibility by um, measuring each of the notes. And here we have the violin above the central line and the piano below. So the red um, um, level is the notes that are played in the score, and they can be added up to half bars and full bars, so you can see some kind of um, um, skyline, um, a graph of tempo flexibility, and uh, although um, the, the measurable di differences show in this paragraph, the piano uh, sounds quite stable. And then we have Josef Joachim on top of it, playing up to more than a 16th note earlier when he reaches the high note in um, bar 20. So um, that would be an interesting point. And the question is, is that intentional or did it just happen? Would that be repeated in the next performance? So um, I think with this um, representation, it's very intuitive to see how um, temporal relations work. Um, we call this the butterfly graphic, and we um, uh, developed that from Hermann Gorczewski's skyline graphic, which only uses half of it. So in combining those, I will play it to you again, you can see how these two tempo concepts interact in ensemble playing. And it's interesting to see, again, Marianne Rankin writes about her um, lessons with Josef Joachim. Again, there was a jargon word for that called Freispielen and uh, very specific uh, exercises of how to achieve that. And it's a sort of a, a tempo flexibility, but it starts with accelerating to open up space for important notes, to stretch them. And it's very unlike modern rubato where accompaniment and um, uh, um, solo line have very similar strategies. So this independence is part of something that is repeatedly attributed to Josef Joachim's um, unique playing style and his students and the German school of the late 19th century, um, early 20th century. So that's an important um, bit of information where we recognize things in the artifacts that we have words for from the perspective of the uh, professional performers um, teaching and practice. So after analyzing um, the recording in this very detailed way, um, we then tried to find out whether in this recording Josef Joachim adapted his playing to the very primitive analog uh, recording technology, whether he would play louder or more harshly than he would have done in um, the, um, the concert hall. And that's um, part of uh, source criticism, of course. You need to find out how credible is what I get, how much is 
the result, the artifact, depending on outside um, conditions. So um, this is why we set up um, a recording system uh, with a phonograph, tried, trying to find out how the recording um, technology impacts the performance. We also found out that uh, Josef Joachim only um, had an hour to record um, six um, matrices, matrices, and um, that he likely did not um, prepare a lot. He was not. He was. He never talked or wrote about the recordings, um, and it didn't seem very important to him. Um, so it's likely from outside information that he did not really want to adjust to this no uh, novel technology. But anyway. <laughs> So of course, uh, before we we did um, this reenactment, we needed to decide about fingerings, um, about um, bow changes and uh, colors, and of course ensemble playing. So that that's the the work that needs to be done first before you then can proceed to these other questions. And we made a video representation of uh, what we found here. we found how well uh, done this recording was. Uh, with primitive technology of 1903, this is very high quality uh, recording of Josef Joachim, who is the oldest uh, violinist on record. Right, so this is what our audiences encounters when they go to YouTube and Spotify. They listen to all of these old recordings, and especially opera lovers. They know not only Maria Callas, but Maria Callas' uh, teacher and their tradition very well. And they do compare what they hear in the concert hall with what they hear and what they find appealing. And if you look at the commentaries in, on YouTube, you find that people are frustrated with many standards of modern classical music performances. And I think this is a potential that we can use as researchers, as performers, and as, as specialists in early music who are trained to look at the circumstances, acquire new te technical skills, a new understanding for a diversity of different styles, where this really calls these specialists into action for the future of early music, and maybe the future of music uh, performance in general, because everyone faces diminishing numbers and audiences and um, the money problems and all the things that uh, post-COVID uh, even exaggerated right now. So here, I think, research into something that matters to audiences um, can make an impact that um, could be a game changer. And it could also be an interesting stimulus for performance studies and um, uh, sound studies in, mu uh, in musicology. Because for the longest time, musicology was very much focused on written sources and uh, acknowledging that performers were actively abandoning the written correct performance for something that everyone agreed to be beautiful performance. This is really an important divide in our understanding of what performance was and is and could be in the future. So thank you very much. Yes, please. After the streaming, of yes. course. Yeah. Um, 
When I compare now, I mean, it's not the first time I heard you, Akai, you know that, but um, when I compare these um, recordings, these early recordings that for at one moment for, in my life were so shocking and so confronting, if I can uh, compare them now to what we heard um, earlier today with the Nimich and the other uh, mechanical instruments, they seem very moderate in their freedom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know what I mean. Um, they seem very civilized compared to the, the the more rougher irregularities that, if I can, if I can say so, in the earlier um, in the mechanical instruments. Would you agree to that? Do you see? Because one of the questions you formulated in the very beginning is the question also Sigrid formulated: How far does everything go back? Do you do you see any evolution um, according to what I just observed, or is that just my impression? I think there is a long durée there, as w um, in a very specific way. Um, if you read what people talk about uh, playing classical music um, in a natural way, in the wake of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, it's very clear that nobody would ex uh, expect um, the score to be sounding or performed on stage. Like Nicholas Cook uh, coined this term, page to stage, that's what we do mod in our modern way uh, of performing music. That was probably, in a historical way, that was never a goal. Um, the score was always regarded as a vehicle for something that could not be captured by notation. And this is, this is a standard, and the way people deal across nationalities and across the styles can be different, but this is shocking enough for our um, 20th century tradition. But my point being that, um, whereas I thought that, that the, the, the early 20th century recordings are already very far away from our modern habit, now I, I, I feel that they are much closer by compared to the earlier um, recordings, so that there was a, a sort of evolution towards, um, yeah, towards coming closer to the score, in a way. Yeah, well, that's the, the danger of uh, being a historian, that to create narratives, uh, or a narrative Evolutions, of that's evolution right. or legitimization or um, all kinds of narratives. Yes, I think um, we have lots to do by just um, looking at the artifacts themselves and trying to make sense of the details, because then we're safe, we're uh, in, a, in an environment that we, we can manage as researchers. And of course, we can draw conclusions in an artistic field from that, mm -hmm. from these experiences. But that's um, a different branch that's playing with our um, experiences or the expertise that we get from looking closely into these artifacts. Just uh, well, fantastic talk. Uh, very, uh, just, just fantastic. Uh, just a couple of things, though. That I mean, which sort of augment what you said about uh, composers not observing what they've done. It's famous recordings of Elgar uh, conducting his music and telling the orchestra no, and they're actually playing what's written, but he says no, you should do this. And sort of Stravinsky mentioned as well. Uh, the other thing, just going back to basics, there's photographs which you showed of string quartets. I know of no string quartet on period instruments, or perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, or a certain amount of instruments just sit in this manner with the violins facing each other, and like they do in the orchestra, with the violins split and the cello or, and uh, viola separate or back and forth. And here you have photographs. We're not talking, well, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you have photographs. And nobody observes. I, I got into fights with the Emerson Quartet about this, who are all dear friends of mine. And I mean, they completely are went in a completely different direction. They practice every single thing with a metronome. They perform, so they have, their performance is like zero freedom, although technically perfect. But um, I just think in, in schools would be the best way to you have all this documentation, all these recordings that can be used as teaching methods, basically, uh, which maybe is being done in some, some places. But we have this wealth of information now on the internet, which is free, basically, on YouTube or other, other places, use Spotify, where you can actually hear performances of people playing music like this. And I mean, no matter how much research you do, just listening to something is clears up things that you would you spend hours trying to tell a student to do. So um, I mean, there's, there's hope. In, in a sense, as you're saying, it may be opening a new window or a new chapter on performance in general, which I think would be great. And especially in post-COVID times where people are looking for certain kinds of answers, this might be one of them. So. Yeah, I totally agree. Thank you. We'll take maybe one minute break to set up chairs down there and we'll be back in a minute.
Okay, so shall we start? Well, okay, that's uh, the final part of today. It's the uh, panel discussion, and um, it's virtually everybody sitting here, and who's not sitting here is uh, cordially invited to take part just as if he or she would sit here, I suppose, I suggest, actually. Um, yeah, we heard a lot of um, uh, papers about uh, historical performance practices today with very different um, topics, um, focusing on very different um, aspects of um, music history. Unfortunately, I had to skip one of them. Um, nevertheless, I was asked to ask the starting question to, to get into uh, the, the talk. Um, and so I, I'm not so much referring to any one of the uh, papers uh, we, we heard today, but I, I'm not really a specialist of um, uh, historical performance practice, and uh, one of the musics I'm specializing in is so far away that we know even much less about it, namely 13th century uh, motets. There are so many questions I would like to know, and I would love to have such beautiful and interesting recordings uh, <laughs> we heard today. Uh, no idea how they um, performed this. Um, uh, but the question I, I, I think we, we might start with is um, different. I uh, remember for a biography about um, Handel, uh, written by Hogwood, um, that Handel and the, the king were somehow struggling about uh, how many... Um, instruments they should use for the firework, uh, music to the royal fireworks. Um, and at, at that point I was thinking about um, uh, historical performance or the, the research of historical performance practices uh, mainly focusing on the question, uh, and that makes sense of course, um, um, how did they do it? Um, you know, what instruments did they use, how did they play it, uh, the tempo, um, and so on, all these things, or the stage about uh, what did they do on, on, on stage and so on. Um, but another element we are never really discussing, and I mean, there are obvious reasons for that, but it's an interesting question nevertheless. The question we are rarely asking is how did it feel to hear the music in, in the sense? And the, the, the difficulty in that is, I think, if, for example, Handel and the king are struggling whether they should use like 10 uh, uh, violins or 20 or so, um, today we are used to uh, rock concerts which have a totally different kind of power and, and loudness. Um, so re reconstructing how it sounded then is something else, I think, and that would be the question as reconstructing an effect which was, would equal the effect then. Uh, but of course, I think there is no measure for that. But that would be my question. What, what um, role does it do with uh, recent, and you're sitting here on my side, with reason, recent uh, performance practice researchers, um, what role does the question play? How does it feel to hear the music in a certain way? No, I'd like to start with that, that's no problem. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, um, just as Professor Kai Kup here has um, divided the research, and he does that in a very methodical, methodical way, into different stages, I think that the curiosity to find out how it, how it was performed, um, if, if at all possible, with all the elements, is only a stage in the process of performing performing that music. In my case, for example, for the topic that I presented today, and indeed, I, there's already a long mail from my friend, I can say, a colleague, uh, Roland Wilson, um, that indeed the, the, the modern performance circumstances are different than the ones that, that... But this is something that you can only know if you really study the source itself very well. A second part to my answer would be that if you want to create a, an effect that is similar to an effect that, for example, um, King George must have had um, with the royal fireworks. Um, um, I think that also the, the very object that, or the, in this case, the music that is performed would be a different music. So it is, if, you, if you 
undo one thing, you undo also the other thing. Uh, on the other hand, and um, I don't I do not believe in in in, in that uh, story of a linear augmentation of noise in modern times. I mean, I was born in the center of Bruges, for example, was well, lived in the center of Bruges. I can assure you when a horse with a cart came by on the cobblestones that there's nothing um, with modern technology that equals the sound of, of that, <laughs> for example. <laughs> but these two thoughts would be, would be my, my, my answer to your question. Yes, I have maybe another uh, perspective there as well. I, I recognize um, quite a growing interest by musicologists in the history of listening or hearing. And um, uh, it's part is coming out of the um, uh, discipline of Rezeptionsgeschichte, mm -hmm. reception of music, um, which relies on, um, um, on well, very individual sources, like reports by individuals who had, um, sometimes it's easy to uh, assess their training, their ear training, sometimes it's not. So it's very difficult to establish a picture or some general information um, from these very diverse sources. And the other thing that I think is overlooked, if you want to talk and research about uh, the history of listening, you need to um, be very clear what they heard. And they did not hear the score. And many people who do research on the history of listening assume they heard the score. And that's um, a, a blank spot in music musicology. Which the most difficult things is the performance space, which is, we say, the, to, uh, as I asked this morning about the space for the motet. Um, you cannot uh, do a B minor mass in a concert hall. And I mean, of course, the effect of the music comes across, but the acoustic is completely wrong. And I must say, one of the reasons I'm an American, one of the reasons I moved to Europe is because uh, the whole thing of performing religious music in concert halls in churches doesn't exist in America. First of all, there's no churches to do it in, but it's not a tradition. And so here, at least in Europe, there's a tradition which still holds in a lot of places. You do Baroque music or sacred music in a performance space that is e that's equivalent to what, somewhat to what was d done when it was written. So that's a big uh, problem we face performing at period instruments when you have to do a concert in a modern concert hall. Acoustic is completely different. Often the acoustic is not very good at all. And as you mentioned, all these spaces were more intimate, more private, and, and uh, it just has a completely different aesthetic which we don't have. We can recreate, recreate it in our performances, but the actual space that the music's being performed in is totally different, and that creates a problem for every performer, of course, but certainly when you're trying to reproduce something as beautiful as what happened 200 years ago. Yes, and in, uh, in correlation with the, with the space, I think it's also a huge difference if you stage historical um, informed staging in an theater like in Droppingholm or in the Goethe Theater, for example, or like in Karlsruhe, which was um, ein Betonglotz aus den 70er Jahren, where the, the, the audience is sitting and being confronted um, with a total other uh, atmosphere at the other side. Um, and so this is, this is um, and also the audience in those times, they knew what they were expecting. Um, it was a visual display that um, was not new for them. Eventually, um, they could even have seen the same stage sets over and over again in different, um, uh, in different, different performances because they were not recreated for every new opera again. So this, this history of, of what does the, the audience expect? The audience was also very loud, for example. And the question is, all these gestures eventually or s actions, were they maybe also meant to say, hello, let's look at me, uh, or just have your ice cream now, or close the curtains in your loge and be private. Um, it is also sometimes the question that they ask me if, um, if we would uh, try to get the audience dressed uh, in a historical way and teach them how to react or that they can go in and out, talk to each other, eat, um, uh, ev eventually um, stand up and discuss other things, for example. Is this something that we also have to do to uh, come close to the reception of what is then performed with so much care of research, for example? But still, I think we can't avoid we live now, in, in the world we live in, and we think now, we are beings from now. But I think an essential element in, in, in your question is also what, what you mentioned before, what do we consider uh, a piece of music? Is that the score? <laughs> or is that within an, a fork of possibilities, a number of p possible and acceptable performances? 
And I think that for us, the answer is clear. It's that second thing, it's the latter. It's, uh, I'm sorry, just talking about, about performance of, of, of music, it's, it's the, 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 uh, what, we, what we think, at least what I think, it, what a composer um, considered a composition is what she or he had in the head, you know, the, 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 um, the acoustical construct and, and of which the score is then the blueprint. And, and uh, I think that to, to emphasize the importance of, of, of what this performance could have been or performances could have been yeah, within a fork of, of possibilities of, of, of acceptable, acceptable sounds already so official, but, but, but um, that this is what we are fascinated, fascinated with. And that the second question is, do we still care about, about all that? Because if we don't, Let's throw all these music pieces away, all these scores then, uh, and, but let's also close all the musea because we don't see the Caravaggis anymore also in the place that they were to, um, um, meant to, to be. So it's a very complex question, but I, I really, really believe as soon as you consider the, 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 the actually sound of a music piece to be the music piece and not the score, that you inevitably um, are confronted with that, with that problem. Problem with that issue. I think this thing, at least in my mind, connects to the modern recording industry. Mm -hmm. um, because it's not only the score right now that we are dealing with, it's countless reproductions of that score that all of them are unfortunately almost sound the same. For let's say for an amateur, they could not tell the difference between any historical groups that I can assure you, but even not between modern groups that play historically informed to a historical group. So for them, it's all the same. And uh, doing some quite many recordings, I can tell you it's all about being together. It's exactly against what you say. And even if you deliberately try to hit the top note, not at the same time, will be put together later by a very uh, by, by a very good sound engineer because this is what peop th they assume people want to hear. So this is one thing that I'm kind of for years already against all these reproductive recordings that we did many of them together, Petra. So we know the goods and the, bad, the good and the bad sides of them. And another issue is maybe I have a question. Kind of um, I don't know if you notice you probably. We don't notice it anymore, but we live with a constant click. Every time you open the radio, every commercial is recorded on a click, which is very stable, and every pop song is recorded on a click on a metronome. And I wonder, do you think that has something to do maybe with the resistance to really go far away with this, uh, let's not call it rubato, let's call it uh, forward and ruhig? <laughs> Um, yeah, well, this is a very complex question, and you would need to have psychological expertise uh, for that, which I don't have. Um, I can only um, observe how audiences are reacting to non-standardized performances, and how um, they are still embracing what uh, early music um, movement abandoned, which is the concept of authenticity, um, which was something that was created for audiences as an appealing keyword or as a, some kind of an advertisement. And then, of course, in the, uh, in the 2000s, there was this authenticity debate that, that we all know, um, in a way, um, discarded the concept and disappointed audiences. Um, so if we, if we do talk about listening and audience expectations and uh, perceptions, I think um, this is something that audiences still expect from professional musicians on stage, that they have some special experience while they're sitting exposed to music. And uh, that's another advantage of um, the embodiment or, uh, of, of these early recordings or early recordings in form performance, that we can reclaim authenticity if we engage with a, a certain recording. And this would be something that's attractive for uh, audiences as well, and bec because in, in classical music, there are, of course, there are elite uh, uh, listeners. They have a background of research, maybe, or very dil diligent work in their everyday lives. They understand diligent work on music, and sometimes I think um, um, some managements disrespect the diligence with which audiences um, go to to a concert and try to present them with some kind of a pop 
um, effect. And there is this kind of appeal in, in these free performances uh, because it survived in, in um, pop cultures or um, ethnic cultures. But it could be brought, brought back into music as something that's authentically historic and at the same time destandardized and new. So this is why I think there's a lot of potential in early recordings and form performance. I have a question to Zikrit, actually. Um, and it's regarding, still, I feel today, if you come and you perform a Handel opera on modern instruments, it's almost never heard. Like the historical performance practice uh, won, so to speak, the, the battle of... of uh, we use the right equipment, I'm quote unquote, yeah, it's all <laughs> debatable, of course. It goes as far as Mozart, maybe, that you hardly hear, maybe with Mozart a bit more, but modern orchestras, they rarely play it now. And with 17th century, almost there are none. However, in the staging world, it is not at all the case, although there are a few um, historical staging productions per year, but I would say, I don't know, I'm just guessing, but the majority that I've seen are still ultra-modern in respect to the historical instruments that are being used, and I wonder if you have any thoughts of why is that? Like, why is the staging so behind uh, the music? Um, I think because the two worlds are totally divided, um, what is in the pit and what is um, on the stage, and uh, Opera is, in the first place, um, designed or presented by the stage director. And this is, this is um, you know, you see this handled by Carson. <laughs> this, this um, you know, uh, this is the big name, which is, and then comes the, the, the musical director. So uh, it is all about what a stage director uh, will do with a piece in many, many layers and many, many respect. And it is um, uh, now almost not done anymore to do then um, a Handel opera with a modern orchestra. So it is kind of normal that they have it in the pit, um, but it's a big no-no to do that uh, still on the stage because there is an, an enormous fear that it will be not modern. I don't know why, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not the best one to ask to answer that question. <laughs> um, yes, I, I I don't know. It's um, if you do not have a concept that you can lay over um, a piece of musical um, uh, theater, um, then you are not a stage director. The fact that um, um, they think that you are doing some sort of museum work and that you, as a well, me as a cor corago, the concept of corago is a big no-no nowadays because it means that you have no artistic value and no art artistic story to tell and that you are only reconstructing something, um, which is it's very strange because at the same time, that same uh, theater will uh, invite a Baroque orchestra with a specialist who is directing in it and who knows very well the sources and is acting uh, according to the sources, if but everything this, goes well. this is this is then not um, seen or felt as uh, museal art, uh, but almost necessary. But when you do that on stage, um, they can't believe that you make even decisions, and um, they think also very often that uh, every piece from from 17th, 18th century has a staging score, and that as a stage director you just interpret that staging score, but that doesn't doesn't exist at all. So we all, me and all my colleagues, we take uh, decisions from minute one until <laughs> the, the the last rehearsal, because we have to take these the decisions and make our own score according to the rules, of course. Um, but this is not uh, seen as a valuable artistic uh, creation. And so it, it is, it is um, they are af afraid to present that. This is, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of showing a bit the hypocrisy of uh, histor the historical performance yeah. practice world. I'm yeah. saying it is part of it, but it, it's, it is like that, we all know. Uh, we choose what we like and we implement mm -hmm. that. And there are the other historical 
um, things we know for sure, evidence, we just disregard. Uh, yeah, but it's also the institution of the stage director. Right? It's really the institution. We don't yes. have to be more negative about that, than, but it's an institution. It's an accepted institution. And, and it is very strange. <coughs> you can, um, I can do a, um, a staging and then the critique afterwards can be, oh, this is so choreographed and it looks like dancing, meaning it is not right or, or not whatever but in an, in another performance of this the same Handel opera or Mozart opera or Heineken or whatever um, you can see critique from how oh, this uh, stage director what he did it was like wunderbare personenregie and it was so choreographed and the same discourse really the same languages and then they think it's wonderful because somebody invented it and it was a personal choice um, but with the same words and just the idea that it comes from an older um, language um, is, is already an, a no-no for most of the uh, opera establishment, unfortunately. I sometimes um, sometimes uh, had the impression that uh, this comes from the uh, 19th century aesthetics tradition, uh, which expected to find uh, some non-historical truths in, in artworks, like the, the art religion. And uh, so the, the consequent step is to say we have to stage operas in a way that speak to the recent, to the modern audiences. Um, um, but the most directors who do this aren't aware that they are so deeply involved in 19th century. Uh, they, they think they are really modern, but in fact, my impression is this is really the, the root is in the 19th century uh, aesthetic tradition. And uh, the, the confrontational uh, aspect of that all is the audience does not react like that. The audience is so open and so moved, really, like an historical, uh, emotional um, reception, <laughs> like in the really moved. So the audience is there. Moreover, I think that the, the evolution you point at is rather 20th century than 19th century because there are m many more traces that the many 19th century is, is just continuation of most of the things that happened in the 18th. Um, so it's more, much more recent. And it, I think all that has a little bit to do with the, um, the gigantic crisis that Western society has had after the First World War, that the, that the, the great changement or the great divide is, is to be located there. Rather than Although the idea that um, art tells uh, yeah, yeah. deeper yeah. truths uh, has roots in the 19th oh, uh, absolutely. century. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, something else that occurred to me, Peter, when, when you were um, uh, uh, giving the reasons um, or the, your ideas about um, uh, historically informed um, praxis was um, the analogy between older music and the museum. And I find, um, I totally agree with that. Um, although I know that this is not self-evident for many people. Like if you read, for example, uh, Karl Dahlhaus, the Grundlagen der Musikgeschichte, he will always make the point that the raison d'etre of musicology is the fact that older music is still object of uh, a modern aesthetic uh, pleasure, in a sense. Um, you would never expect something like that if you go to an archaeological museum. This is not a presupposition you have no. to make, but for Karl Dahlhaus, th this was always very important. And I uh, see with my students uh, that any kind of music which doesn't belong to their everyday uh, surrounding is somehow strange to them. So if I'm even offering a, a, a class about Bela Bartok, this is so far away from mm. them, um, they don't know why they should go there in a sense. This is different with art history. They, it's f totally normal for them that they are uh, ha having classes about like 17th century art. Um, what happened to musicology? Why is this the case? Has yeah. anybody any idea? So that's a very interesting question because it doesn't happen to cuisine either, right? Sorry? It doesn't happen to cuisine either, right? No, they would be interested in, in, or, uh, in, in, in in foods from other cultures, I, I don't know. It's an interesting question. Why musicology? Perhaps we have to get rid of musicology. <laughs> <laughs> don't say this here. <laughs> I, my interpretation of the answer to the question is if there's more exposure with museums, they're open, 
all the time. People can go, for, I mean, for the, to go to a concert of Bartok is not so normal. And Beethoven, yes, but not Bartok in terms of the amount of music performed. Of course, it can be heard on YouTube, but it's, as you said, it's out of the general sphere of most of your students probably, but I'm sure most of them have been in museums uh, at some point and know at least about French painting or Italian painting, Baroque painting, whatever like this. That's what I would guess is the amount of exposure that's given for this kind of music. Same thing with uh, extreme contemporary music. Uh, and extreme early music. I mean, this, right now, unfortunately, we were talking with, with my colleagues earlier, it's so difficult to get music performed that's not Mozart or Beethoven in a concert hall. Uh, I've done many recordings, as you have, of lesser-known composers, and they just the presenters are afraid to program this music because it's not known. They're afraid no one's going to show up at the concert. They won't sell any tickets. So um, that's why you, if you look on concert programs, there'll be 10 performances of Mozart Requiem during the year and Beethoven on almost every program mixed with something else. But the amounts of Bartok or, let's say, lesser-known 19th century or 18th century composers is unknown because of the amount of exposure. That's my answer. I, I see that, although um, a, a Mozart seminar doesn't, a class doesn't attract many more students, <laughs> only a few. And is it is the fact that we in, live in a very visual world that, that young people would be more flexible in that respect than in purely acoustical? Yeah, I would think th uh, there is an issue with um, visuality and, um, well, a less trained ear. Um, because then you only take into your ear what you think doesn't harm you or what, what's close to your, to your heart. And with visuality, there's... Um, the, the, uh, you, you get many more pictures from, from other elements um, that, that you can consume uh, in this way. So I really do think part of it is um, ear training. Um, and that's a, a wider issue. And if I may, I also think a bit of branding. I speak now as the, as the concert organizer, but it's, it's not only exposure, I, I, I think. But for instance, it's it's rather silly example, but this festival used to be called uh, Kölner Fest für Alte Musik. And we really felt Alte Musik, especially for younger people, it sounds, it, even in German, it sounds very unattractive. Who wants, if you don't know what it is, you really don't want to go to that. Mm. Early music sounds somewhat better, it's still not perfect, we need to work on that. But I also think it's a question of how we see ourselves and because it's a world of, of Branding and 60 notes messages. I mean, you need to be very exact with your message. And we still have a, f a good way to go in that in our field in order to survive. Here's maybe another thing. Um, if music analysis or um, professional musicology um, abandons biographies and looks only at artifacts at, at, or just at scores, uh, we lose something that, um, uh, of course, other music um, transports, which is the person behind it, the performer, um, something that's, that's touchable or uh, perceivable. So um, a lot of um, developments in the 20th century or in contemporary 20th century music abstraction um, uh, is, is probably part of the, the, the reality that we're dealing with right now. Interesting question. I never realized that there was such a difference between getting young people in touch with uh, visual arts, visual arts from, say, the 17th century. And then... Yeah, I speak from my <laughs> experience. Uh, and uh, I realized this as a problem, uh, especially during the last only a couple of years, really. Um, not more than 10 years. So, and then really significantly, um, uh, the, the interest in... in Older music significantly uh, was uh, getting reduced. Yeah. With this happy note, <laughs> it's not really a happy note, but maybe we can kind of summarize. We have three minutes to go. And uh, yeah, if you have any last words, maybe that you wish to share. Um, for no, for me, it was really, you know, as a, as a practicing musician, and as a concert organizer, it was fascinating to see all those connections between things that are hardly ever being respected by a musician that gets a score or a concert organizer. That, uh, th there is so much more to dig and dip, to dig deeply and, and to get yeah, information that will really turn our worlds upside down, like what we revealed today in, in regards of tempi, rubato, uh, uh, orchestration, uh, etc. For me, it was uh, 
truly mind blowing, and I hope the research will keep going, and the institutions that you all are part of will, yeah, will take this torch uh, onwards. Otherwise, uh, yeah. And I think that we have to take as much of, of that sort of material in. Also, we as active physicians. I remember um, years ago when I, I told you that story, Kai, when I first invited Clive Brown for a two-day session uh, in the school was a teaching, and he started the, the, the workshop with an, an early recording of um, Marie Soldat, a violin player. And so I was the one who invited him. So my students were sitting there, and I was sitting, and I was listening. I said, oh, my God, do I have to like this? <laughs> <laughs> and then, so he, we talked, and we read, and we listened for two more days. And he closed that same workshop with that, the, the, the workshop with that same um, recording, and I noticed, noticed to my own enormous surprise. Of course, I was eager, I was, but that I was touched by that very same performance. And of course, you are there, hungry. You want to learn. You want to understand. You want to um, culture your tastes. But that this can happen in two days. Imagine what could happen if we would feed ourselves with with that kind of of, of new information. How what we could then change, perhaps, well. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Henschel, for the hospitality. You're thank very you. welcome. <laughs> thank you for all the speakers, for our technical team. Thank you, Tsamu's team. And yes, you're in the concerts. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much.